start uh, this new session, okay? And um, today we're going uh, to continue uh, about, let's say, uh, statistical mechanics approaches for non-equilibrium systems in relation to biology, and it's and it's my pleasure to introduce Patrick Pietzonga as our first speaker. Uh, Patrick uh, studied did his PhD under the supervision of Udo Seifert in Stuttgart, and then. Um, he has been working on the topic of stochastic thermodynamics, where he has made important contributions, especially related to uh, what is now known as thermodynamic as a thermodynamic uncertainty relation. Now, Patrick, um, I know him personally because we have been collaborating in topics related to my single molecule experiments in my lab. He's now uh, in his postdoc, I think his first postdoc, I would say, with um, um, in the University of Cambridge, and he's continuing uh, he's continuing this work on stochastic um, thermodynamics. Now, um, his talk today will be um, his talk today will be a guess related to some of the work he's doing with Mike Cates in the University of Cambridge. And uh, his title is Autonomous Engines Driven by Active Matter, Energetics and Design Principles. Thank you very much, Patrick, for accepting our invitation. I pass you the word. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Felix, and thank you to the organizers for the invitation. It's, it's a pleasure for me to be there. And yeah, so it's my first talk online, so I hope everything will go well. And yeah, I thought to start, uh, as this is a session about stochastic thermodynamics, I should at least say a few words about what stochastic thermodynamics is about. So the main idea is that it's basically classical thermodynamics, but uh, on a microscopic scale. And the big difference there is that all the the observables you usually look at in thermodynamics, like heat and work, these are then considered as fluctuating observables because you have uh, random stochastic thermal noise everywhere on that small scale. For example, if you look at such a molecular motor, it is basically a thermodynamic engine that is burning some chemical like ATP to, to produce some uh, propulsion or to, to make some displacement on, along a filament. And if you repeat such an experiment, you will not always get the same results, but you will get some fluctuations around the mean. And stochastic thermodynamics has given us lots of results to describe exactly these fluctuations. And probably the most prominent classical results are the so-called fluctuation theorems. And the most prominent one maybe probably you have all heard about it, is the Yarzinski relation. And uh, in the past 20 years, stochastic thermodynamics has evolved. And the most recent results is a class of results, results we call the thermodynamic uncertainty relations. And its most fundamental statement can be illustrated with uh, such a molecular motor. It's basically telling if you have some uncertainty in, uh, in one of those thermodynamic observables, for example, in that displacement, you can look at the variance of the displacement divided by the mean squared, and that gives you a measure for the precision of such a machine. And it's also a measure for the performance because it's telling you how, how, how well is that machine at outrunning the thermal fluctuations. It's not just about producing some bias, it's also about being better than, uh, than the thermal fluctuations. And this can be quantified in terms of such a uh, uncertainty variable epsilon squared. And the thermodynamic uncertainty relation is telling us that the product of this uncertainty uh, with uh, the total entropy reduction, the rate of total entropy reduction is always greater than two times KB. So it's telling you that if you want 
a small value of that uncertainty, you have to pay for it in terms of overall entropy production. So to say heat that is dissipated into the environment. And I won't go into much more detail about that today. So if you're interested, have a look at, at these papers and in particular that recent review here. But I'm telling you this to show you that the overall entropy production is a very important quantity in stochastic thermodynamics, uh, which basically quantifies the non-equilibrium character and the capability to do something useful for any, for any thermal machine. And uh, for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to connect more to active matter, which has already been introduced yesterday. So you all know what active matter means. We have a big assembly of, of self-propelled particles. And uh, in order to do stochastic thermodynamics for these active matter systems, the first step is to identify this important quantity, the entropy production. And indeed, this is what people have tried to do. And it has been a surprisingly controversial topic. So there have been different ideas around of how to quantify the irreversibility or directly the entropy production. And this is not a complete list of papers and I don't want you to copy all of those uh, references down. I just want to show you that there has been quite a lot of, of uh, literature being published on that. And it has been surprisingly controversial. And the problem was probably that people could not really agree on what are really the relevant degrees of freedom to look at. And uh, the contribution of uh, Udo Seifert and myself on that was basically in order to have uh, a well-defined uh, measure for the entry production, you need to look at a well-defined microscopic model for active particles. And then you can really identify the heat that is being dissipated into the heat bath. And uh, so I think we now have pretty much understood what entropy production is. But of course, you might argue that active matter systems, and you have already seen yesterday, that active matter systems can do much more than just dissipate heat into an environment. So what useful can it actually do rather than just dissipating? And one thing that I found really inspiring is uh, that people have tried to build uh, engines, thermodynamic engines, that are operating on active matter. And one of the first suggestions has been to build something called an active stirring engine, where you have everything that you would usually have in a, in a stirring engine. You have a cycle of uh, compression, expansion, and heating, cooling down. But uh, the heating and cooling down is not really a change in the temperature, but a change in the effective temperature of a bacterial bath surrounding such a such a colloidal particle in a trap. And uh, this is a very, very interesting concept, of course, but I think it's not, uh, it's still very much inspired by our classical idea of what an engine is doing. It's basically the same as, uh, as uh, the classical Stirling cycle and the activity doesn't play the central role. In contrast, I think there is a much simpler design possible for engines driven by active matter. And uh, maybe you have already seen one of those videos. That is the concept I'm going to exploit, that if you immerse an asymmetrically shaped particle into a uh, bacterial heat bath, then this uh, leads to a spontaneous rotation of such an asymmetric cog. And that has been shown already 10 years ago by the Dillian Auto Group experimentally. And uh, it's a very interesting observation because it's something you would never get classically. If you just build such a Feynman ratchet, put an asymmetric object into a classical fluid, then you will never see any rotation. That would be against the second law of thermodynamics. But if you have a non-equilibrium character in the system, if you have that bacterial heat bath, then you can kind of evade that second law of thermodynamics and such a particle starts to rotate. And now one thing you can imagine is that you are using this rotation to actually lift a weight. And in that way, you build a very simple heat engine. And I think uh, it's more useful to look at this simple design rather than to look at the cyclic engines. And one important aspect about that machine is also that it works completely autonomously. You just feed the bacteria, but you don't need to drive it in any kind of thermodynamic 
cycle. It's just working on its own. So this is the kind of machine we wanted to investigate. And because we are theor theoreticians, we try to simplify things at first. So rather than looking at such a rotational machine, we were rather looking at a translational motion against uh, an external force. So this external force is basically replicating the effect of such a weight that is being lifted. And if we are looking at a translational motion, then of course we need to have periodic boundary conditions. Otherwise, this particle would just hit the wall at some point. But also, we are saying that this is like being guided on a railway. It cannot rotate. It's just going in one dimension and it's being driven by these active particles. And the idea is, of course, that active particles would get trapped in here and then lead to propulsion of, of that uh, obstacle. And uh, yeah, so the first thought was, let's try out. We did some numerical experiment, uh, experiments, and the first idea we got was, let's make that V-shaped particle. That's the geometry we went for at first. Let's make it as big as possible so it can trap as many particles as possible. But very soon found out that this is not the best strategy. So it actually turned out that if the particle is so big that it covers the whole uh, width of that simulation box, then we get a zero propulsion. We can't extract any work. And uh, as a very general result, we then found that it, it is crucial that the active particles can pass around this passive particle. It's something you can prove analytically that only if particles can pass by, it may be possible to extract work. But this is just a very, very general result. It doesn't tell us yet how efficient such machines would be, for example. So in order to get more quantitative results, we have to dig a bit into the equations. So the way we are building our model is that we have a passive particle uh, with a coordinate rp. It has some mobility, mu p. It's subject to that external force. And it's also interacting via potential with uh, all those active particles, the red ones here. And of course, there's always some thermal noise. And as I mentioned before, we are fixing uh, the motion of that passive particle to the x-axis. So there is only motion in x direction allowed. And for the active particles, we have also a coordinate Ra. And they have a mobility, and they are driven by some active force. And of course, they're also subject to that interaction with the passive particle. And basically, the shape of that potential is also encoding the geometrical shape of, of the passive particle. And uh, these directors, they are performing a rotational diffusion. So these little arrows I'm shown here, I've shown here are uh, these directors along which that active force is acting. And again, we have some, uh, some uh, thermal noise in that motion of the active particles. And now you can look at the output current, which is basically just uh, the average velocity of that passive particle. You can look at the extracted power, which is just the external force times that current. And we compare that extracted power to what we call the active power, which is basically just the power that is delivered by all these active particles. So we're looking at the active force in uh, the uh, direction of this director and the scalar product with the displacement. And we average that over time and over all the different particles. And that is giving us the overall active power. And we use that to define the active efficiency. So we look at how much is extracted compared to how much is being put into that system. And of course, that has to be lower than one. But we are interested in are there any, any stronger bounds than just one on that. And uh, so one of the first observations was that power and efficiency of such a machine are highest have slow rotational diffusion of the active particles. 
And of course, that makes sense if you consider that if you take an active particle that is doing a very quick rotational diffusion, then that active particle will just look like a regular passive particle that is performing uh, a random walk. So uh, then, uh, then you know from the second law that a very quickly rotating or quickly uh, diffusing uh, active particle would not allow you to extract any work. But if you have such a time scale separation between the rotational diffusion and uh, the translational motion, then there is a chance to have high power and efficiency. So that's what we are looking at. And it also makes uh, life easier because we can exploit a time scale separation to get analytical results. Because what we can do is we can solve the Langevin equation for the relative coordinate between the active particle and the passive particle for a fixed angle. So we can keep that angle fixed, look at that relative coordinate, and look at uh, the average uh, velocity for fixed angle phi, and only in the very last step, average over all possible angles phi. So that's how we can describe a single active particle. And to get the current, which is the most interesting result, we would then just take this uh, relative velocity v as a, as a function of the angle phi, integrate over phi, and you see in order to get a big output current, this integral here should be as big as possible because we have the negative sign here. And we need it to be big enough to outrun the effect that comes from the counteracting external force. And now let me show you some results for that V-shaped particle. So what we were looking at is what does the relative velocity in X direction do as a function of that angle theta. And just to walk you through that plot here. So you see, for example, if you take a, a particle that has angle 50 degrees, such a particle will sooner or later get trapped in that V shape. So for example, here for all the angles up to like 70 degrees, the relative velocity gets down to zero because the particles get trapped. And for all the other particles that are going in, in towards the left, we want them to, to hardly interact with that obstacle. So ideally that should go to the left unhindered. But uh, of course there's some interaction. That's why you see such a shape of that curve here. And of course we would want it to be as small as possible. And I think the V-shaped particle is already doing quite well in delivering some current. You see you have that large negative contribution here, which leads to a positive output current. But of course this is not a very nice function and it's very hard to, to get a hold of it. And again, as a theoretician, we wanted to make things simple. So let's, we thought, let's build a very idealized machine that is just accomplishing what I just tried to explain, namely that any active particle that is going to the right should somehow be trapped. So the relative velocity should go to zero here and we should let it pass if it goes to the left. So that would be a kind of ideal filter and then you just get the cosine of the angle as the relative velocity. Now, of course, I can't tell you how we would actually build such a filter, but we thought that this is some kind of the idealized machine. It should be something like the Carnot efficiency or the Carnot engine in that business. And you see that indeed that filter always has a relative velocity that is lower than what I just showed you for that V-shaped, chevron-shaped particle. So we thought this is really the best design there is if one, gets, can, if one can get any close to it. And we try to prove that this is indeed an upper bound for the efficiency or the output power of such a machine, but somehow we couldn't. So instead we tried to do even better than that. And indeed we found a design that is doing better than that high, highly idealized filter. And that is what I call a kite shaped particle. So the important thing is that it has a very long tail that guides particles towards the left. So we are arranging these kites uh, as in such a pattern that a particle that goes upwards gets really 
shifted or gets forced on a trajectory that is going to the left. And that is adding extra propulsion. And you see here, if you look again at these angles, 90 degrees, that's something close to the green trajectory you see here. In that area, we really get a relative velocity that is below what I supposed for that idealized filter. Now, of course, if you look at particles that are going towards the left, they are always harmful. So you always get uh, a contribution that is harmful for the large angles. And for the very low angles, like for example, 50 degrees, we still want to have the effect of, of uh, the V-shaped particle. That's why we have added little wings to these kite-shaped particles. So they just do the job of trapping all the particles that go to the right. So this was a kind of engineering problem to get that ideal, or it's probably not the ideal shape, but it's a highly optimized shape. And we see that indeed this might do better than this highly idealized filter. So let me show you some results for the power as a function of the external force. That's the kind of loading curve we're always looking at. It makes sense that if you have a zero external force, you always get a zero output power because you're not lifting any weight. And if you're increasing the load, then at first you're increasing the power until the load gets too heavy. So we can't, we can't lift it anymore. And then again, the power goes down to zero. So this is a typical curve we see. Basically the same goes for, for the efficiency. And this is the curve for the chevron particle. Uh, based on numerical results. The next thing I'm showing you is this filter particle. The nice thing about this is that we can calculate it analytically. It's doing much better than the chevron particle. And finally, I'm showing you the result for that kite shaped particle, which as you can see is performing best. And, uh, but still, I, I think uh, it's convincing that the filter particle, which we can handle analytically is giving a very important benchmark and the kite shaped, the highly idealized particle is doing about 5% better than, than the filter particle. But still, as you can see, the overall output power is still very, very low. And also the efficiency is on the order of 10 to minus three. So even for the highly idealized design, we couldn't extract much power. And then we thought, well, maybe that's just the way it is. If we have active particles, there's always some random motion, active random motion going on. So there's always heat being dissipated everywhere and there is no chance of extracting a bit, a big chunk of it. But still we went on and you know, I've just told you about a single active particle interacting with that obstacle. And the next thing we were investigating is a passive particle interacting with many active particles, as you would expect it if we are talking about active matter. And uh, the, the approach we took in order to get analytical results was some kind of mean field approach. So we have already understood the interaction with, of one active particle with the obstacle, and we are trying to reuse these results. So what we are doing is we're looking at a single active particle, which is representative for all of them. And we look at the interactions with that passive particle. And uh, what we are, the effect that we are accounting for that comes from all of the other particles is just added as uh, a background effect, namely as just uh, a contribution to the external force that comes from all the other particles. Now, of course, this approach has to be self-consistent, namely the force that we are assuming there that comes from all the other particles is the same as the interaction force we are calculating for that single particle. So that uh, demand for consistency gives us one equation. We have one unknown, namely that interaction force. So this is a solvable problem and we can indeed calculate total current Namely, we just look at the mobility of the passive particle times the external force plus n times that self-consistent interacting force. And uh, of course, we are treating all these particles as, uh, as still independent. So we are neglecting interactions between the red particles 
but we have the interaction with the blue particle. And now we got a very surprising result, which we couldn't believe at first, namely that now the power and the efficiency were much higher. So rather than just getting 10 to the minus three, we are now uh, getting like 10% efficiency even, or close to that. And uh, we have again the same result that it's uh, less power for the filter and, and for the chevron and the best power we get for the kite. And uh, it's uh, very strange that we get this collective effect. So again, I'm showing you that even if we highly optimize the single particle case, we get about 1.5% and we get 8% efficiency if we are looking at the many particles. And of course you would expect that if you take n times as many active particles, you're also extracting n times as much power, but in fact, we are getting more than that. We are getting uh, like one order of magnitude more output efficiency than we would have expected. So this is some kind of collective effect. Particles are interacting indirectly via this uh, passive particle, and that leads to some coordination that increases the overall efficiency of that system. And so this was a completely theoretical uh, prediction based on that mean field approach. And uh, indeed, we tried also to confirm that numerically. So Etienne Fodor, who was also in that team. <coughs> Five minutes, Patrick. Okay, that's fine. And uh, Etienne did some simulations. Uh, so basically, he was just simulating active particles interacting with these kite-shaped obstacles. And the same effect can be seen here. And also what he has confirmed is that it was a good assumption to look at a high persistence of the active particles, because you see if you're increasing the persistence length, you're also increasing the output power of that machine. Yeah, and with that, I'm coming to the conclusion already. So the first part of our work, which is published here in PRX, uh, that uh, the first uh, step we did was to identify thermodynamically consistent definitions for heat, work, and efficiency. I didn't go into much detail here, but uh, now it's possible to, to identify all these uh, terms consistently. And uh, the next thing was that we looked at the ideal shape of these particles. Namely, we, sh we have shown that if we use these kite shaped particles, we can really extract the best uh, output power. And finally, I've shown you this collective effect, namely that if you take many, even non-interacting active particles, you can get a higher overall efficiency. And with that, maybe I should just uh, make some advertisement for Yong Ju Baek's talk. He was using uh, also different uh, similar systems. He will talk tomorrow about that. And he also showed that even if you take symmetric particles, uh, then you can still extract some work. So I'm sure Yongchi will be happy to tell you more about it tomorrow. I'm also excited to hear about that talk. And yeah, with that, uh, I'm finishing the talk and I'm looking forward to your questions. Okay, so it's a, uh... Thank you very much, Patrick, for this very interesting and suggestive uh, talk and very, very appealing questions. So I think we have uh, some questions at least. I see two questions by Rahul Marathe from IIT in Delhi. Please, uh, Rahul, you can proceed. Uh, hi, problem. Patrick, uh, uh, very nice talk. So I have a couple of questions. So uh, one of them is related to this uncertainty relation that you discussed in the first slide. Yeah, very quickly, uh, only. sorry about yeah. that. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so what happens in case of, let's say, uh, the distributions which have, let's say, power law tells, where uh, the moments are ill-defined? 
Yes, so, so that's something we haven't looked at yet, but uh, our focus was mainly on finite systems. So we were looking at small systems with a few degrees of freedom. And then you can prove that uh, the variance is always well defined. Okay. And uh, for infinite systems, like you're probably hinting at, that's what you need to get these power law tails. If you have a, a large system size, if you look at the thermodynamic yeah. limit, then that might happen. But uh, I'm not aware that anyone has, uh, has investigated that yet. It might actually be interesting to look into it. Okay. And the second question is about uh, this asymmetric object motion that you discussed. Yeah. So when you have interacting particles, uh, active particles, then you see these different phases at right? the collective motion and so on. So yeah. how will it uh, affect in general, the efficiency and power, uh, do you think that it will be even enhanced rather uh, than uh, non-interacting particles? I'm doubtful about that. So we I haven't see. looked much yet at interacting particles, but you are absolutely right. That is the logical next step to take. So we were looking at non-interacting particles, but uh, if they are interacting, then uh, the game really changes. And I would, guess that it's harmful to the efficiency because the particles are busy with themselves interacting with each other and that might lead to more uh, to more uh, um, dissipation of heat but uh, you see this system has surprised us so often that i wouldn't be surprised in the end if actually yeah. as you say that might further enhance the efficiency it's it's yeah, because searching but we don't have inter no, sorry uh, yeah because non interacting active system seems uh, very ideal to me yes it is yeah. uh, but still i think if you look at a dilute system this is not such an unreasonable uh, unreasonable choice if if no. there's uh, if just if the particles are small they will mainly interact with the obstacle but not so much with each other but if it's a dense system then of course you're right then this doesn't work anymore okay thank you Okay, good. So we have another question by Miguel Ruiz Garcia from UPenn and UPM, please. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. So I, I think, uh, so I, I got the intuition about how to optimize the shape for, you know, optimizing the effect of a single particle. Yes. Uh, what is the intuition? Like, how, how would you optimize the shape to enhance this extra work that you obtain from the collective uh, behavior right like or uh, you know what i mean right like yes you, so you because, could say that has uh, our our uh, design study so to say that has been based on the interaction with a single particle yes yeah and uh, now you're asking what happens if you look at many particles so basically our result was like i've shown uh, here for example is that it's saying there's still the same hierarchy. So the chevron is still doing worse, the V-shaped particle. The filter yeah. is the better and the kite is the best. So at least for that mean field approach that we took, it really looks like this, the design principles are the same if you're looking at many particles. And that is basically because the, the single particle solution is again what we take as, as a starting yeah. point for our mean field theory. But uh, as we have already just discussed, uh, the game might change a lot if you're looking at dense suspensions, if you're looking at strong interactions between the different active particles, then I wouldn't guarantee you that a kite is still the best design. And uh, again, I agree that it would be super interesting to look at what, what is taking the place of the kite. And of course, uh, what I didn't really mention there is that what we are really looking for is something like the Carlo engine. What we are looking at is, is there any, any ideal engine like the Carlo engine has been for classical systems? And we thought at first the, kill, the filter would be one, but actually now we see that there are maybe better designs, then it would be super interesting to really see what is the one that is doing best for an interacting system. But it may be that you have a different ideal engine depending on the on the particles, right? And the interactions and so on. Yeah, yeah. But uh, of course, it's very hard to, to get that shape. And of course, if you take many interactions, you have many degrees of freedom. And uh, probably it would be a very, very complex machine. I mean, you could run a machine learning algorithm on that and look what what is extracting most work. 
and and maybe it, it is some fractal shape of of that particle we just don't know so it's something we should investigate okay okay thank you very much uh, thank you so we have uh, well there was one more question but it was already answered um, I see we have still five minutes I don't see more questions let me ask uh, you something Patrick um, let me ask you, ask you something Patrick so you started with these beautiful experiments by Roberto Di Leonardo in Rome where he showed how active particles can make the will uh, turn and actually in that case as these are experimental results, it's possible maybe uh, to get some estimates of efficiency that compared to some of your uh, model predictions. Is that possible? Uh, we haven't worked with experimental data yet. And, uh, but maybe in the paper, he already uh, discusses this issue of the efficiency uh, of how much of the internal energy, active energy is transferred into uh, motion. Um, is this the case or um, I don't know, I'm just asking. Um... Yeah, so we are thinking about that, but uh, I think in the end these bacteria suspensions are not uh, are not ideal for, for looking at that because the, these bacteria, you know, they are dissipating heat everywhere. So I think even if you would build such a machine based on the De Leonardo experiment, it would be after all a highly inefficient machine. But uh, what we are actually suggesting, so I didn't go into too, uh, too much detail here, is that we should really look at that active power rather than the true chemical power. Because the true chemical power is something we can never really get a hold of. Uh, but what we might be able to get is if we can really look at uh, the trajectories of all the active particles and we can get a hold of this effective self-propulsion force, which is after all an effective quantity, then we can get an estimate for the active power that we can show is always less than the true chemical power. But the reason why it's important is that this active efficiency is still bounded by one. So that quantity here might be the one that is more interesting uh, practically than the true chemical power. And I think this active power is indeed something that could be measured in an experiment if one is able to track into individual active particles. So on that basis, there, there, there are actually, uh, um, Patrick, there are actually these nanorobots or cubots. I don't know if you have heard about them. These are small microscopic objects that move linearly. I mean, they move, they, they really realize experimentally your two dimensional setup. Uh, yes. These are called cubots, uh, nanorobots. There are small devices that move and change orientation when they collide with a wall. And, um, and, and maybe this could be the right setup uh, to, to, to compare with, uh, with the theory. It would be nice to do that. Yes, yeah, so very interesting. Even uh, especially if you take into account fluctuations as well, then we might use the uncertainty relations again to, to get a yeah. hold of, of uh, the power, the dissipation power. I see, I see. Okay, so um, I don't see there is any more question. We have two minutes left for Patrick. Um, no, so if not, uh, we thank again Patrick for his uh, presentation and the beautiful talk. And we move on to our next um, speaker, who is uh, Efe Ilker from the Curie Institute in Paris. and. Efe will talk about shortcuts to adiabaticity, counter-diabatic counter -diabatic driving in biophysical processes. I pass you the word, Efe. Okay, you see my screen now? Um, we do, yeah. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, so uh, what I mean by adiabatic and counter-diabatic is gonna be clear in a moment. Uh, so, but uh, here I'm gonna talk about driving in uh, uh, driving the real-time dynamics of stochastic processes in uh, biology, and okay. 
Okay, so uh, and uh, this finite time uh, control is an important uh, thing for the biology. Time is a major constraint for life. Uh, the living processes are uh, in contact with an environment and this environment might change rapidly. Uh, for example, for cells, there could be sudden changes in the environment pushing a osmotic stress and the cells are often at the limit of crowding and with the osmotic compression, uh, the volume would shrink. So they would get overcrowded uh, such that all the biological signals slow down. And unless they find the solution to that in a finite amount of time, these cells will lose vital functions and therefore go to death. And throughout the evolutionary uh, timeline, the, this living organism must have found solutions to this type of rapid changes. And the same story goes in the developmental dynamics that the organism should follow certain sequence of events to uh, have a successful developmental program. And similarly, in the intracellular processes, the cells make temporal decisions by locating, for example, a droplet at certain location to accelerate the, uh, some chemical reactions. And if they want to change this, either they have to disassemble this one or to localize it in a different way. And at another scale, this uh, humanities uh, uh, fight against fast evolving pathogen is also a, a uh, uh, control against time and uh, that's what we are doing against now a, a disease such as COVID uh, while we are trying to find the solution it's finite time at the same time you can try to uh, slow down the origin of the source by slowing down the epidemic spreading and that's what we do by uh, social distancing okay so in the end these all processes are uh, stochastic so the, with this stochastic aspect it becomes uh, more challenging to control the real-time dynamics and the inspiration of such a control of in a system with inherent this stochastic properties comes from quantum adiabatic computation. And in this case, in the quantum case, the idea is to uh, prepare the system in one of the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian H0, typically that's the ground state. And the goal is when we vary this uh, Hamiltonian over time, we always want to maintain the system at the ground state. And one way to do that, and we change this uh, Hamiltonian over time through a control parameter lambda. Uh, and the one way to do that is to do this extremely slowly, meaning adiabatically. Uh, but if you want to do this at a finite time, uh, then this would uh, induce transitions to the excited state. So in order to prevent that, we use this auxiliary uh, Hamiltonian, which has the uh, information about the time evolution of this guy. Therefore, it can compensate for these losses. And the similar decomposition can be uh, taught in uh, general Liouvillian systems where we would, for example, want to follow the stationary state of this uh, original Liouvillian uh, while we do the time dynamics by using this auxiliary field. And now that we can form this, uh, we can generalize this to other systems, uh, uh, we are now building up new examples in the biology and now we are doing these first two examples in applied in biology of this type of control. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, to control the evolutionary dynamics in genetic variants in a population. Uh, so this is recently published and there we find the uh, control protocol in evolutionary dynamics and that's useful to uh, find uh, uh, therapy strategies against complex diseases and the general evolutionary systems. But what I'm gonna talk about today is the second example. Uh, uh, it's gonna be the uh, cells response uh, uh, under heat shock. Uh, so just to understand this uh, driving, uh, I have this simple example. So you can imagine a, uh, there's a, imagine that we have a road uh, with so many turns and there are bumps on the road. Uh, so one way to keep track on the road is to go very careful and slowly. Uh, so if we instead go fast, there's a risk that we deviate from the road and we go out of the path. Uh, but what CD driving is doing is it's like we are adding extra material to the car. We could add spoilers at the back of the car, uh, creating a, a counteracting velocity field such that we always stay on this road. And we can think of this as a, a inverse problem. So the goal here is to find the operator we should apply in order to maintain the time dynamics we want. And so for that, we do a, a decomposition in the system. So we assign a control parameter, lambda. And for this lambda, you can always calculate a long time stationary distribution. 
But if you just apply this as a, a, a controlling field, then your actual system uh, will always lag behind the desired state. So what you do is you calculate for this loss and you use a, a modified control parameter or control parameter set uh, in order to keep up with the desired trajectory. Okay, so the first example I'm gonna show on stochastic systems is a, a optical tweezer setup. Uh, so this is, we have a bead uh, uh, diffusing on a, uh, uh, in a solution and there is a laser trap and this potential can be approximated as a harmonic potential where the width of this potential is controlled by this uh, coupling constant K. And since this is a diffusive particle, the long time equilibrium is in the Gaussian form. And we can control this distribution uh, by controlling this coupling constant. So if we vary this over time and bring it from point A to C at a finite time, uh, we will be able to change this applied potential and this would have associated long time uh, distribution. But uh, when we do this at a finite time, the actual system, as we see, there's less overlap. So it actually lags behind because of uh, uh, loss in the system. So when we apply the counter diabetic field, it suggests that we use a modified control parameter. So we do a slight overshooting on the control parameter. We uh, use a modified uh, uh, potential. And in the end, uh, we will be able to keep up with the uh, uh, desired trajectory. And you can see the uh, time evolution contribution in here. And this is shown uh, experimentally in Silberto's uh, group in 2016. And this corresponds to one example of the continuum models. Uh, uh, the one I'm gonna talk about is the discrete state Markov model. And we can actually generalize this through the discrete state Markov models. Uh, and then go to the limit where we have continuum systems. Uh, I'm not gonna get into the technical details of that, but in the end, once you find a solution for your time evolution, you should still approximate to a, a, a potential or something that you can apply on the system. So in the previous case, we were changing the coupling constant of the potential uh, for the molecular interactions, we will change the uh, uh, molecular concentrations. Okay, so the example I have is the chaperon upregulation as a, as a response to heat shock in the cells. Uh, so we know this traditional view of protein production. So we have transcription, translation, all these steps require uh, energy consumption. And at the same time, this protein is eventually degrades. So we also have the maintenance cost to keep up these protein levels. And for single-celled organisms, they are often uh, very near at the limit of the efficiency. So even uh, expressing a single extra protein can be evolutionary significant for them. And actually in a recent work, we showed that this fitness disadvantage is linearly proportional with the, uh, at this cost of the extra material. Okay, so <clears throat> this means that uh, this machinery also should work uh, uh, very efficiently. Uh, and we will focus for this uh, uh, protein folding part. Uh, so what happens is after translation, this comes as an unfolded chain. And uh, after that, this protein has to correct the fold to come to this native state in order to be functional. And these all processes are stochastic and this is, these are also a function of the temperature. And we can see in here, uh, the fraction of native uh, proteins as a function of temperature. Initially, there's a plateau, plateau and then here uh, we have a, a sudden decrease, a, a melting temperature, and this is where the human body temperature coincides. And being a little bit higher in the temperature gives a dynamical flexibility for the proteins in order to do their functions uh, faster. But at the same time, it makes them vulnerable to sudden changes in the environment, such as heat shock. And as we can see, even at this uh, uh, normal temperatures, we have the risk of misfolding. And what happens is uh, this unfolded change comes to intermediate state. If it's correctly folds, it goes to native state. And if there's a high chance, it can also go to misfolded states. And there are many of those. And once on the misfolded state, this makes its hydrophobic patches available so that it can start sticking with the other misfolded uh, proteins and that leads to aggregation and this becomes a growing problem for the cell. And the solution is these chaperon proteins 
which attach on the misfolded proteins. And by using ATP hydrolysis, they can bring this uh, misfolded protein to the intermediate state, giving them another chance to uh, fold correctly. And there are many chaperone pathways that's known in the cells. And that's uh, uh, for uh, single cell organisms, it's often the case that under optimal growth conditions, uh, they are used in full capacity. And when the cell enters to a higher temperature environment, uh, here we have the example for a yeast, uh, for a heat shock of about 10 uh, degrees, uh, we see that most of the uh, uh, repair mechanisms are upregulated, and one of which is this chaperone protein, which has a, 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 a peak on the initial stages of the heat shock. And our goal is to understand this upregulation as a control driving process. And for that, we model this system as a, a discrete Markov model. And by using a separation of time scales, we separate this part as a four state model. Uh, and here, uh, these rates are a function of chaperone concentration as well as these ones. And this is a function of the ATP concentration. So our tuning norms in this case are going to be chaperone concentration and ATP concentration. Okay, so right after the heat shock, uh, the system relaxes to uh, some free chaperone concentration. Uh, at the same time, uh, since there are insufficient chaperones, as well as the temperature is high, the uh, misfolded state is, uh, grows higher. And what we want is to drive the system from this state to a lower number of uh, misfolded fraction uh, to prevent the aggregation. And the simple solution is to calculate this long time equilibrium that would give you this uh, chaperone concentration in the end. But as I've shown previously, if you just follow this, uh, this would develop lag with the desired state. So for that, you have to solve for this uh, counter-diabatic uh, uh, protocol. And when you do that, uh, you see that uh, this suggests that you have to overshoot on the chaperone concentration in order to catch up with the desired state. But at the same time, you also have to, uh, you need a little nudge on the ATP concentration to accelerate this dynamics. And we can see different uh, speeds, uh, and they all have the uh, similar uh, uh, trend as we can see in here in the chaperone concentration and ATP. And here we can see the trade-offs with the power consumption. And this is already a, a non-equilibrium stationary state. So even at the, uh, without driving, this system will consume uh, housekeeping. There's ho housekeeping power consumption that also changes from this state to this state at the end. And this is the part that only occurs during the driving process. And as you can see, this increases with the speed of the uh, uh, driving interval. Okay, so when we look at this, the, when we look at the experimental data, we see the evidence that the, our uh, uh, predictions are also seen in the experiments. Uh, we see uh, uh, upregulation of the chaperone on the right, you see. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it shows that the, there is a, a help needed from the ATP concentration as well. Two minutes, Efe. Okay, so just to conclude, uh, I would give you an outlook. So these uh, counter-diabetic control techniques are very new for the biological systems. Uh, with this, once we form the stochastic aspects, it could be uh, possible to apply it to diverse systems. And we can also form other parallels from the uh, quantum uh, systems, such as the quantum speed limits in order to see the trade-offs, uh, uh, and the speed trade-offs uh, with under finite resource constraints. And the other areas could be uh, what I'm planning, for instance, is to apply this to many body dynamics to also control the self-assembly processes in the cell. And finally, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, my collaborators and thank you for listening okay thank you thank you very much efe so um, i think it's time for questions and i don't see any question in the chat um maybe uh someone wants to i have okay there is a question by 
Daniel Shara from Yale, please go ahead. Yeah, hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was just wondering uh, if you could explain a little bit more about how a faster protocol in the counter diabetic case, if you're able to hit the target long time distribution with that faster protocol. Like at the peak, it seemed like you also hit the same, the target distribution. Uh, you mean in the uh, optical tweezer one? Uh, yeah, I think so. I'm thinking of the example that you gave where there is a point A, B, and C, and at B, you also were at the target distribution. So here, this is the one without driving, mm -hmm. uh, uh, counter diabetic driving. So there is a lack of overlap in here. And right. when, we, when we apply this solution, so you apply this plus this part. So this is also a good example because uh, uh, the, the minimum of the potential doesn't change. It's only the width that changes. So that can give you directly this diffusive property. So you are actually counteracting for this uh, diffusive losses in the system by uh, adding this part. And that okay. way you accelerate the dynamics to keep on the desired state. Mm, perfect. Okay. Thank and you. And then you can bring the system at the equilibrium much faster and then just uh, switch off all, everything and you are there. Mm. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Felix, I think we can't hear you. Oh, sorry, sorry, I muted because there was some noise in the background. So no, I, I was just saying that I don't see uh, any more question uh, okay. in the chat unless anyone else wants to ask one more question. We have three more minutes. Maybe you could just briefly, um, I mean, you, you explain uh, in your talk, but maybe you could emphasize um, the new element of this counter adiabatic nudging, would you say, uh, as compared to the standard um, feedback protocol in which you change uh, the stiffness, for example, of the optical trap or any other parameter, um, in this case, you're introducing a new feedback protocol to match uh, the time. So your constraint is to match a final time for, for your process. Is that correct? Yes, it's final time as well as actually you can also keep up the entire trajectory as you wish. So this, um, and this is especially important because many of these feedback protocols uh, are implemented in systems in which you don't have, um, you don't have any interest in matching a finite time. You have interest for, for instance, in reducing dissipation. So you want or you want to extract maximum information, or you want, usually you apply these protocols, these feedback protocols to convert, for example, information into useful work. But in your case, you don't want to do such type of conversion. Is that true? I mean, your efficiency uh, of your protocol is not related how much uh, you can convert information into energy. Can you say something on this? Uh, in, in some sense, I use the information, so I dissipate more in these systems by doing this, trans, uh, this uh, driving. I'm just using the uh, information to keep up the system in the state that I want. So there you can put, a, for example, a loss function. It depends on what your objective is. So you might want to follow a certain trajectory saying that this is the minimized loss and stuff like that. So that would give you an access to choose the path you want to follow. So there is no inefficiency parameter in these sort of transformations. Um, in your case, you don't have an efficiency parameter. Is that no, no, correct? Not, or? No, yeah, yeah, it's not defined in here. It's, it's not defined an efficiency, okay, yeah, yeah. okay. But you can define an efficiency. I understand, I understand. Okay, so unless I don't see, I want to use your time, Efe, to give you the full time, you're allowed. I don't see any more questions. No one from the audience wants to ask a last question to Efe for this very interesting new turn into, um, into feedback and 
protocols or I can say one more thing. So another thing that I didn't give the example, but the another thing we have here is that since you can shape the landscape uh, of the system on the uh, time while you are wearing the overtime, uh, that actually, even though you do non-equilibrium driving, you can make measurements as if you are in the uh, equilibrium distribution. So one thing we were thinking is the uh, applications on also this uh, pooling experiments uh, to extract uh, more reliable information while the system is varied in non-equilibrium. Okay, okay, very interesting. Thank you very much, Efe. Thank you. So, um, so now it's time uh, to move to the next uh, speaker, and uh, the next speaker will be um, on self proletic foretic active colloids in confined geometries by, um, let me, by Tassin, the name, let's see if I can pronounce correctly, Tassinkevich, M. Tassinkevich, but I don't have the full name. I want to see in your screen, okay, Mikola Tassinkevich, okay, from the Centro de Física Teórica Computacional de Lisboa. So she will talk. Uh, so I will tell you, Mikola, Mikola, two minutes before the end, before the, uh, 15 minutes, I will uh, tell you, uh, let you know that uh, you have two minutes, you have to finish, okay? Thank you very much, I pass you the word. Okay, thank you, Felix. Thank you for your introduction. Good morning, everybody. So today I will speak about uh, one class of active particles, active colloids, and particularly on the behavior of these active particles in confined geometries. So in the next slide, I schematically show the particle I'm going to talk about. So it's a Janus colloid, which is usually made of silica, micron size, which is partially covered by a catalyst. In this example, is a platinum. So when this active colloid is placed into a special solution, like in this example, water and hydrogen peroxide, then this platinum will catalyze redox reaction of hydrogen peroxide decomposing and the net reaction in the simplified way can be uh, depicted like a decomposition of hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. And then due to the asymmetric coverage, we'll have a gradient of concentration of reaction products, which are depicted by a green circles here. So, and because of this gradients of the solid concentration, <clears throat> the surface flow, so foretic for so-called so foretic flows will emerge along the surface of colloidal particles. We can calculate this surface flows and macroscopically this surface flows which are driven by the interaction of the product with surface of colloidal particles can be presented in a simple way like the surface flow are proportional to the lateral gradient of concentration. So, and since the system is mechanically isolated, the particle will propel into the opposite direction to the surface flow. And direction of the motion depends by the type of the interaction. It's it, not universal. It can be either against catalyst or towards catalyst. Now in the next, so, the, so in this case, the mechanism of motion will be self-induced diffusiophoresis the motion of colloidal particles in self-generated gradient of a neutral solid. So in this example, I show you experimental situation where you see colloidal particles half covered by a platinum black hemispheres, which are moving at the bottom of microfluidic chip. They are moving along the bounding surface and you see nicely they are moving away from the catalytic cup and keeping the orientation in plane. However, if you would try to see the motion in the bulk, you would see that the direction of motion changes with the rotational diffusion. So let me, on the next slide, briefly summarize the model of this active particle. So this is the most minimal model. We have an active colloid in a bulk. We assume that the diffusion of the product diffusion of the product is much faster than the motion of the particle. So in this way, you can decouple diffusion from the convection and we can treat problem mathematically in two steps. So the concentration field is governed by a time independent steady state Laplace equation. 
where d is diffusion coefficient, c is the concentration field. We have a boundary condition on the inert part. We have a reflection boundary condition. On the catalytic part, we have a source boundary condition. This is the simplest way to take a, into account reaction. So we have a constant rate emission. Once we solve this problem, we can calculate this so-called phoretic slip velocity, which would be then plugged in into a second problem, hydrodynamic problem. So now we must solve for the hydrodynam hydrodynamic field U around the colloidal particle. So it's a standard Stokes equation, low Peclet number regime, we have pressure, viscosity, fluid flow, supplemented by inc incompressibility condition and the boundary condition on the sphere. It suggests a non-slip boundary condition, unknown velocity U, angular velocity omega, and this slip velocity, which is given by the concentration field C. And then this system of equation must be supplemented by a condition of torque-free and force-free. And this gives us desired propulsive velocity U and omega. Now, as I told you, in bulk, direction of motion would change due to the rotational diffusion. So our main motivation is how to control the directionality of the motion. One possibility would be just to apply external field by a properly designed particle. For example, particle with some magnetic cores. And when you apply magnetic field, you can control orientation of the particle nicely and it will swim along the line, along the line given by the external field. However, this, this is not what we want. We want a more autonomous way to control this behavior. And our idea was to use boundary, confining boundaries. Why this is promising and interesting. If we look at the disturbances created by a, just a simple planar wall on a property of the system, we find out that let's first concentrate on a particle which are far from the confining wall on a concentration field. Our active particle acts as a, as a source of a solid. So in far field, it can be approximated as a, mono, as a source monopole. And then the wall can be taken into account by a image monopole, which is placed at distance minus h. And then disturbance field from the, from the image decays like one of a distance. And then this will give a diffusio phoretic component to the particle velocity, which is proportional to one over h square. So that velocity will be proportional to one over distance square. Now, if you look at the hydrodynamic flow, our particle is force-free, so the leading order far field asymptotics would be a force dipole in the hydrodynamic flow. The wall, the presence of the wall here, can be taken into account by an image force dipole plus higher order terms. So then the leading asymptotics in, in the disturbance flow field would also decay like one over distance square. So hydrodynamic interaction with the wall would also reveal the same asymptotics. So we have a very interesting far field behavior when the concentration effects and the hydrodynamic effects have the same far field asymptotics. And this can give rise to an interesting phenomenon. So now we consider a, our micro swimmer near flat wall. As a first step, we consider just a flat, inert, non-slip wall. So we supplement our equation by a boundary condition to the flow field at the wall, non-slip. And for the concentration field, it's just a reflecting boundary condition. So our goal was to find velocity linear and angular as a function of the distance to the wall and the angle theta, which the direction of the motion makes with a normal. Now, there were several interesting non-trivial behaviors. But from the point of view of directionality of the particle, the most interesting is so-called sliding bound state. I show here an example. We have a flat wall, we have a colloidal particle, which start at some orientation and some distance to the wall. And when we release it, it approaches the wall, then re reorient its direction of motion and get trapped into a sliding steady state, which doesn't change its property with time. So the main mechanisms of this sliding steady state is the two rotation. The first rotation is driven by the interaction of the particle with the wall. So the hydrodynamic interaction of the particle with the wall always tend to rotate direction of the motion away from the wall. 
then accumulation of the solid or reaction product between the wall and the particle would give rise to a so-called phoretic self-rotation, which opposes this rotation due to the hydrodynamic interaction. And the balance of two can lead to the emergence of the sliding steady state. And here I show you a configuration, color code, color encodes concentration profile, concentration of the reaction product, and the blue and the light white lines are the streamlines of the flow. So when the particle would proceed like this in infinitely long at a constant distance and orientation, obviously without fluctuations. Why this is important? Because if we look to the phase portrayal of the dynamic system in the plane of the distance to the wall and the orientation, we see that the dynamics of the system is dominated by this attractor, the sliding fixed point, which has a large basin of attraction which means that this attractor will, will attract, will collect particles from the various initial condition. And this can be used as a first starting point to control particle motion. For example, we, together with our experimentalist, look into this system experimentally. We have a flat wall, which we have patterned with a shallow topogra topographical step. So this circle is just a shallow, several a, a fraction of a particle radius topographical contrast. And now when we place active polar particles to this system, we observe nicely, nice guidance of these colloidal particles along the edge of this shallow topographical path. And this can be understood as a combination of two attractors. One attractor emerges along the bottom wall and the second attractor emerges along the edge of this step. So the combination of these two attractors leads to the self-trapping of particle along the edge. This system also is functional at small, at, 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 at larger curvatures. Even the topographical post of a very high curvature are efficient in trapping colloidal particles. So this active colloidal particle can make several revolutions around the wall around the step. So we can, in that sense, this shallow topographical contrast can serve as a railway for the colloidal particles. Next question which we ask, can we use this self-trapping and then endow some structure to our wall in order to better control particle motion in flat geometries? So in this case, we, could, we ask question, can we guide particles at chemically structured surfaces? So in this case, we need to modify properties of our wall. Since our wall now is chemically patterned, the gradient of the solute close to this wall will also generate, due to the phoretic mechanism, uh, for, uh, uh, surface slip velocities at the confining walls. And now the non-uniform gradients, uh, non-uniform concentration profiles along the surface will also give rise to the upper and slip velocity along the wall where B parameter controls the interaction of the solid particles with this wall. And this is a lateral concentration gradient along the wall. So by patterning the wall chemically, it basically patterns this way how the solid interacts with the wall. And then indeed, we find an interesting behavior. If we pattern our wall by a simple chemical stripe where the gray material interacts more strongly with the solute than the orange. And we consider a particle which moves away from its catalytic cup. We find that at some condition, this particle can dock at the interface between gray and orange region. Another type of particle which are designed in such a way that they move away from the inert part, we can find, so we can find a situation on this, when this particle from a various type of initial condition can find its way to the middle of this chemical stripe and robustly follow it with a constant orientation. So this is interesting because this demonstrates that this simple, simple geometry when you have a just one chemical linear stripe can serve as a road to these active colloids. So what is the physical mechanism of this? The first step, Colloidal Nicola, particle. Two yes. minutes. Okay. Minute. Okay. So colloidal particle which moves at the wall 
generate surface flow. If we look to the property of the surface flow, they have a structure of a monopole plus dipole. And the strength of the surface flow depends on the substrate material. Now, if we decompose activity of the particle into a monopole and dipole contribution, we find out that the monopole contribution drives translation of this particle towards the interface between orange and gray surface, while dipole contribution drives rotation of the catalytic cup into the orange material. So, and this is a main physical mechanism. I will skip this phase diagram. So this is a phase portrait, which is in the plane of the distance to, this, to the center of the chemical, step, chemical stripe. And this is the angle orientation of the direction of motion and the stripe alignment. So the phase, the, the dynamic is totally dominated by this fixed point, which is a sliding along the center of the step. Since I have left with a few time, I would just go towards Acknowledgement. So I would like to acknowledge collaboration with experimental group led by Samuel Sanchez. And this is my former group at the University at Max Planck Institute in Stuttgart, led by Professor Dietrich. And to end, I will just summarize my results. So the minimal model of chemical microsphemers, which is that's a neutral self diffusive phoresis, predict a very rich behavior near planar walls. The surfaces which are patterned by a chemical stripes can efficiently guide these active particles. And we find the dependence of the behavior on the particle shape. Rod-like particle can respond differently to the flow field and the spherical particles. And thank you for your attention. And I'm ready to answer any, your question if you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mikola. So um, I'm, thank you very much. Very interesting topic and talk. There is one question by Miguel Ruiz Garcia from UPN. UPN. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So uh, I had a question inspired by the first talk. Like, uh, so in, in your case, right? Like you have, for example, these circular uh, boundaries. Um, the particles can rotate towards one direction or another depending on, I guess, that the direction that they uh, came, right? Yes. Do you think that you could maybe? make the boundary asymmetric in some way so that you know if the particles start to rotate in one direction it gets stuck but if it rotates in the other direction it keeps rotating so that you know at the end you have a collective motion rotating in one direction like all the particles or something. it's just curiosity right i don't know well, if you have oh, oh, so that. your question is if we can segregate um left or one way moving particle from another way by patterning the this topographical step yeah, yeah, maybe instead of having I like think... a cycle, maybe you have like a ratchet, right? And then if yes. they are rotating one way, they get stuck, and if they rotate the other, they, they keep rotating or something like that. Yes, in principle, yes, it's an interesting question. Although I'm not experimentalist, but I think uh, it would be interesting to do it, and it's feasible, indeed. Yeah. So the it particle would very... goes left, left wise would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be kind of the opposite to the first talk, right? Instead of uh, the 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 particles making something rotate, this thing will make the particles rotate. Right? I don't. Know. It was just curiosity. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank thank you, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Miguel, for your question. Um, uh, I don't see more questions or comments. You, we have still two or three minutes. Uh, maybe l let me ask you. Briefly, uh, Mikola. So, so this uh, interplay between um, these surface uh, interactions and the gradient of a solute, like for example, I could imagine uh, a salt that uh, there is a gradient of salt, or or there is just two reservoirs connected by a very thin um, tube or pipette, for example. Um, with an electric potential, suppose you 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 you, dev, you you think of a device. These are very commonly used devices um, for uh, particle translocation across nanopores. You put an electric potential, then you have uh, you have a, a gradient of potential, uh, and they have to go, to go across a nanopore. And you can do that for molecules, but also for micron particles or nano hundred nanometers particles. And this has been studied very much, okay? 
nanopore translocation. Um, have, uh, have, are you thinking about this sort of uh, electrophoretic application, let's say, of your, of your uh, model uh, for nanopore translocation? So what, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, no. So what, what you just mentioned, it's electrophore electrophoresis. It's a motion of uh, charged particles in the electric field. So our um, system is a little bit different. We don't have, so indeed, in some experiments, there was evidence that the mechanism would be a, this so-called self-induced electrophoresis, when this electric field emerges along the surface of the particle spontaneously, not imposed by external sources and indeed this me me mechanism is operated op operational there like electrophoresis self-induced it's more complex to describe but basically basic phenomena would be the same but it's not application which i but what you mentioned translocation of nanoparticles through the pores is not the application which we had in mind we had in mind to use this particles as the motors which would be then operational at micro fluidic chip well i i was actually thinking Mikola, more about this lambda with squared uh, solution um when you have particles in an electric field and you have a uh, you have a, an, a very close aperture across which they can uh, flow so it's more related for example the first talk we had yesterday but uh, is is not necessarily self uh, propelled motion but actually translocation across nanopores I mean, <clears throat> there is a lot of um, studies on this um, trying to um, measure to characterize for example the intensity the carrying intensity as a function of the voltage difference or as a function of the radius of the pore and things like that so i was thinking about uh, these sort of applications but um, yeah, actually, yes, this is, this are, those are interesting, but we had in mind some other direction, like not sorting particles or pushing them through pores, but just using them individually as a small microscopic machine, which would perform some action. So it's a little bit different direction of yeah. which we are thinking okay. to use these particles. Okay, so I don't um see any more question we stop now the the, the talks and uh, now we have uh, i have to ask you to turn on uh, your camera because we are going to take a photo picture of everybody and uh, laura um will take care of doing of doing that and so please uh all, i ask uh, please to all participants to switch on their cameras um before we can take this picture so maybe laura you want to thank you juan juan is doing that today excuse me that juan is taking the photo so I'm a, I, I, juan. Okay. I am already uh taking the pictures so yeah, but it's I see many people we have to wait still there is people um to have to activate their cameras. I see uh, most of them. De Matías, David Reguera, Diego. I mean, many people have not turned on their cameras. Uh, so maybe we have to wait a bit more until they hear that we are asking them, all participants, to turn on their cameras, please. We want to take a picture. Come back to your computer, turn on the cameras. <laughs> That's OK. I think there are enough people. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I got it. Thank you very Perfect. much. <laughs> so. so we have now the break, right? Yeah, we have 20 minutes, right? Yeah. Um, we'll be back at 11.10. Okay. So grab a coffee, shoot yourself. <laughs> and we come you back. You have in. to pause the recording also, I think. Uh, yes, yes. We have our invited speaker Ignacio Pago Navarra from this session. So Ignacio, uh, he's uh, very well known. He's a very good colleague of mine actually because we studied uh, together in the University of Barcelona just with one year difference. And uh, Ignacio has been always working in non-equilibrium physics, in particular uh, starting from irreversible thermodynamics to uh, hydrodynamic fluctuations and uh, he has 
develop much expertise also in uh, large scale numerical simulation codes for simulating uh, non equilibrium problems related to fluids and even other type of uh, systems, complex fluids in general. Um, and more recently, his, uh, um, Ignacio is very well known because he's very active in active systems and he is doing a lot of work in this field, uh, also in molecular motors and uh, especially active fluids related to biological problems in biophysics. Now he has taken recently a, a charge in uh, SECAM, he's director of SECAM, and uh, he is still, however, doing very interesting and outstanding research. So it's my pleasure to uh, give the word to Ignacio. He will talk about active diffusioforesis, mechanisms controlling self-repulsion and collective response of chemically sensitive colloids. So whenever you want, Ignacio, is, is your time. Okay, well, Felix, thank you very much for, for this uh, very kind introduction. Um, and um, indeed, I, I will be, in a way, uh, building on some of the concepts and systems that have been introduced by, by the previous speaker. So thank you. So the, oh, how can I go? Now, so basically, uh, again, in this session, the question is how physics can help us to, to understand uh, aspects of biology, and in particular, the role that non equilibrium statistical mechanics has in the dynamics of, of these systems and in the mechanisms that, that offer sensitive response and control. And there is an obvious connection that I think we are seeing through all uh, the many talks in this session about the relationship with active matter, in which in many cases we do not talk of properly living systems, but these are non-living systems that allow us to have more control on specific parameters and understand what are relevant interactions or classify scenarios uh, in which uh, emerging behavior uh, happens in, in systems that are not forced, but in which there is an intrinsically mechanism that brings them out of equilibrium. And actually also earlier today, we have seen, uh, I had already prepared this slide just to mention how the, the fact that you have systems intrinsically out of equilibrium bring them new physics and qualitatively new behavior with respect to what we know to equilibrium or externally forced systems. And we have talked, we have heard about in particular about the ability to self segregate and possibility to extract or to create motion and to extract work. So I, I don't need to go into detail into this. In, in my talk, I, what I wanted to focus on is in the, uh, this particular type of uh, model system or synthetic system, which are uh, colloids that, uh, in which their interfaces are um, heterogeneous in one way or another, and then they can self-propel. These are like particular realization of micro robots, and as, as experimentalists are able to decrease their size into these uh, realizations of nanobots. Um, and I will focus on analyzing the type of uh, the, the mechanism that determines their behavior, the relevance of the environment and the specificity of their interactions. And to which extent the fact that the interactions that determine their motion and, and collective behavior is out of equilibrium brings them qualitatively new features with respect to what we know in equilibrium interactions. So um, as has been explained uh, uh, in the previous talk, uh, in this, these Janus colloids, typically they, their surface is um, manipulated or is work to make it heterogeneous. For example, particularly well-known case is a uh, case in which uh, silica colloids are covered partially by a platinum surface, then the platinum catalyzes the decomposition of oxygen peroxide. And because there is a gradient in the concentration of reactant and products, and because these uh, oxygen peroxide or the typically is, is uh, has a differential interaction with the two sides of the colloid, then these particles can self-propel. And actually, I mean, it's already, already for now, 
sorry, some time, for example, work by Sen and by many others have shown that collectively these type of systems exhibit behavior, emerging behavior that is analogous in some sense to what we see in um, living systems. They, they can come together, they, they present swarming, they react they, uh, to uh, external cues uh, collectively in, in ways that are akin to what we see in microorganisms, for example. Now, I, I wanted to briefly mention what is the standard scenario to understand diffusal phoresis, because uh, one of the points that I would like to raise is that even if it's very useful, uh, reality or these systems can exhibit behavior that really departs from what Anderson uh, described. I, I refer to Anderson because Anderson published a, a very well-known review that uh, compiles uh, work by, by many people in the community to understand uh, phoresis and osmosis and how it, it emerges uh, uh, from a physical chemistry point of view. The, the basic uh, idea if, uh, is that, I mean, if, if uh, I kind of zoom in, so this vertical axis is really like the surface of a very large colloid, uh, and I look at the detail of what uh, molecules that in interact with the solid of this, this particle behave, if there is a, an attraction of a repulsion, they will have a certain profile. I mean, far from the particle, they will be in equilibrium. But because there is this concentration gradient, there is associated to it a pressure profile uh, next in the vicinity of the colloid. And then if now I can put a concentration gradient along the colloidal surface so that the concentration, say, in the bottom is, is larger than in the top, then there is, even if transversal is in equilibrium, there is a, a, a longitudinal concentration gradient that is coupled to a longitudinal pressure gradient. And if you have this pressure gradient, then you can uh, generate flow. And this, uh, I mean, this is a force balance between pressure gradients and viscous stresses. Uh, and that basically takes into account the fact that these particles typically are in a solvent medium and that leads to a surface induced flow. So all in all, then if, if, if you solve this, I mean, for this particular geometry, you can find out the velocity profile. So there is a difference in velocity between the, the surface and the medium. And this difference in velocity is a slip velocity that was introduced also in the previous talk, which is proportional to the gradient. And then all the details of all, all these details about interactions, the restructuring of the molecules and so on enters in a prefactor. So if now I kind of zoom out and try to think about how this colloid moves or the scales large compared to these molecules, actually, I can think of all these processes that I described to you as in terms of an effective slip velocity that determines how the particle that depends on the concentration gradients along the surface. And all these details, microscopic details, are encoded in an effective mobility. And that's like the standard way to understand phoresis uh, for these systems. And indeed, the fact that you have now an inhomogeneity, as I mentioned, for example, by tapping, uh, capping this, this colloid with platinum, creates naturally a concentration associated to this chemical reaction because the catalysis is not homogeneous. And this gradient is really what leads propulsion. I would say this is the standard uh, uh, theory to, to, or, or framework to, to explain why these uh, particles move. And again, depending on the relative attraction or repulsion, so the sign of this mobility will tell you whether the colloid will move towards regions where there are more, uh, a larger concentration of, of these uh, molecules and it's chemoattractant or it's chemorepellent. Um, one important thing that then I want to build on is the fact that that determines the motion of the particle, but this particle moves in a medium. So from the point of view of the chemical reaction, this particle is uh, a sink or a source of, of some of these molecules. So if I now think not only on what happens on the inhomogeneity along the surface of the color, but I look at the medium, there is a concentration gradient. Uh, and because, I mean, once you produce a reactant and if out of the reaction, when you have a product emerging that's conserved, that, that it's a long range structure. The, actually the concentration profile of the products or reactants uh, around the the, these particles will decay as one over R in an unbounded system. 
which then means that if you think on a second particle, the second particle will have or will be sensitive to not only to what is the chemical that they produce through the, their own reaction, but to the, these gradients. So there is a source for gradients in this concentration that comes from uh, the interaction between these particles. These are chemical interactions mediated by the medium, uh, and that will have that has an important role in how they behave collectively. Uh, I wanted now to look into uh, the implications of this interaction for a particular system that uh, has been uh, studied experimentally, so then we can compare with experiments, which also brings another aspect to this type of interactions. These are actually colloids uh, that have this structure, that, but because of how they are produced, they are not spherical, they are ellipsoidal, and due to their size, they tend to sediment on next to a solid surface uh, in such a way that now their propelling direction is perpendicular to the wall. So you could think this is the wrong system to look at because these are, I mean, isolated, these are very uh, boring objects. They are like trying to swim against the wall. So not, nothing or not much is happening at the single particle level. But if you have now other particles around, as I said, this chemical reaction is producing gradients or profiles uh, that extend laterally into the medium and that has an important influence in the interaction now among some of these particles. So we'll be showing you experimental results carried out in the lab uh, Pietro Tierno in the University of Barcelona where he mixed these active particles with uh, standard silica particles. Now the silica particle is not active but it exhibits a diffusophoretic behavior. So it's sensitive to the gradients of the chemicals produced by the active particles. So what, what and then, and this is an experimental trick that is useful, is that the, the degree of activity activity, how, how efficient on the light, which then means that by uh, switching on and off uh, the, the, the light irradiated with, in particular with blue, then they, it's like a switching on and off the activity of these particles. So what, what they observe is that, I mean, th this is an upper view, so basically experimentally it's a monolayer where you have the silica particles and then the active ones, the active ones are the, the black ones, that's because uh, how they are made. They also have a, a magnetic component that, that have some influence, but I, I will not go into that. Uh, the, the important thing is that when, I mean, for, for the talk, that when the light is uh, on, then they see uh, how the silica tend to accumulate around these active particles. And I mean, if you look now at the large systems, then you, you can see how then very rapidly uh, they accumulate and aggregate. And if you zoom into this region, well, you can see how indeed the uh, active ones tend to accumulate uh, and then the passive ones uh, tend to surround them. And that's a very strong mechanism of fast to uh, aggregate uh, when these um, particles become active. Now, in terms of this diffusophoretic uh, scenario I was telling you, basically what we have is, I mean, as I said, I mean, I, I don't go into, into the math, but you, I mean, it's kind of a standard uh, diffusion, working with the diffusion equation. You have the two active particles. These two active particles generate flow, uh, uh, a gradient, sorry, uh, of this chemical. So if you have two of them, this one, for example, will now be sensitive to the fact that the, the nearby particle is generating a gradient that is uh, a concentration field that is not homogeneous, and then it responds diffusophoretically. So if you do what the maths, and you take into account the presence of the wall to lowest order, then you can see that the relative velocity basically decays uh, quadratically with the distance. If you take an active and a passive one, again, the passive is not creating a chemical, but then is sensitive to this uh, inhomogeneity on, on the concentration of the chemical produced by the active one. And then again, between an active and a passive, there is also relative velocity. Prefactors change. And actually, the, if you compute it in detail, the velocity at which the active goes towards the passive is not the same as the velocity at which the passive goes towards the active. So actually, you don't have action reaction. If you convert this velocity into a force through a mobility, you break action reaction. Uh, if you look at the, I mean, we, we in, in the experiments, they can compare, they can compute the relative velocity of active 
pairs of active or active passive and by fitting them to these uh, expressions then we can get the corresponding prefactors and then we can run simulations uh, Brownian dynamic simulations uh, and then compare with the experiments and actually this attraction uh, has a very strong influence in the type of morphologies that emerge so depending on you can vary the concentration of the passive which is the vertical axis or the concentration of the active particles on the horizontal these are snapshots of of what would be the phase diagram uh, in the dilute phase you typically form clusters that then can percolate into gels and if you go to large density then you go into what uh, we describe as, as a glass we call it gel and a glass because for example if you compute the intermediate structure factor it, it shows uh, a behavior that is uh, akin to to a rest again this is a 2d system so that in itself is a bit tricky but uh, it is consistent with the observation and also experimentally i mean here i show you these are the results from the simulations and then the first column corresponds to images obtained for the experiments with similar parameters and you can indeed see that the morphologies are qualitatively analogous in both cases so i think this is a a, a clear example of how the interaction the long-range interaction through this medium associated to the activity of the particles uh, can lead to uh, a quite a rich uh, set of, of behavior uh, morphologically so we we try to classify the phases and so on so uh, i wanted now to go back so I, I i will not show you a complete uh, thorough picture i want to show you elements that really become relevant when trying to understand how these active colloids move and basically what i've shown you here is how even if you have apolar active particles because the particles are not propelling the interactions the active interactions drive uh, very clearly the formation of uh, these non-equilibrium morphologies. Uh, in, in the rest of the talk, I wanted now to move to, to look at the, the, this Anderson mechanism that I described in the introduction, because that in, in itself is also less obvious. I mean, it, it's quite reasonable, and I, uh, but actually activity, the fact that we have this chemical reaction or, or this interaction, say, with, with chemicals in the medium, if you want to think in, in a potential biological uh, counterpart, uh, it's a non-equilibrium. So we, we decided to go back to the question of, again, I, now I go back to one of these colloids where we have this cap where the chemical reaction takes place. And again, in this case, because of experiments carried out by, by Samuel Sanchez at Ibec, we will look at a slightly more complicated case than the uh, the one that i looked before because now i consider the fact that the the chemical reaction the ions that are produced uh, sorry the the species that are produced are half a charge and therefore i cannot neglect the uh, the electric field um, again the specificity of 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 the fact that this uh, charge uh, plays a role but the general idea behind i think it's it's more generic okay so i i, I look at this uh, case because then i i will show you also comparisons with with experimental results so basically i write down the equations that that uh, also we saw in the previous talk uh, again we have like a diffusion equation for the now i have to talk of two species of ions because i will have the concentration of the positive and negative ions and also then i have to introduce the electric field that complicates the analysis but what lies behind is, is uh, essentially uh, qualitatively analogous to what I talked before. Uh, and as uh, uh, emphasized also uh, before and er in an earlier talks, we have at the surface of the particle a flux of, of, of ions that are released through this reaction. And, and that, uh, again, because it's not homogeneous, then there is a certain angular dependence in this chemical reaction. Okay, so. It, one can write the problem and then out of this uh, one can then write identify what is the velocity of the particle so couple this is the chemical i mean the diffusion equation for the ions and then we have to couple that to the stokes equation for the flow to identify the force acting on the colloid and therefore its velocity and and basically what we can do that i mean it's a bit of algebra but this can be done along the lines also of what we see so earlier i wanted to emphasize in that in this problem uh, the one 
one relevant parameter is, as I mentioned as well, it's, it's the flux, the rate at which this agent is produced. And we wanted to look at one effect that has not been, I mean, has been reported in the literature, but has not been analyzed in so much detail, which is the fact that in many cases, the, uh, the, uh, the anions and cations, because they are not symmetric, they have different diffusivities. Uh, and therefore, there is a, a ratio and another parameter, beta, which is the ratio between these two diffusion coefficients. And what I want to, to emphasize or focus is on the fact that as soon as this beta is different from one, then a different scenario from Anderson develops because, uh, I mean, in Anderson, as I said, one assumes that all the interaction uh, happens in, in, a, in a relatively narrow region around the colloid. And as we move away, we, we are essentially in equilibrium. But in reality, because we have a flux, what we have is a steady state profile for the ion concentration uh, in, uh, around this colloid because this, this net flux being produced. Now, if the flux is very weak, one can neglect that contribution and assume that the ionic flows or the, sorry, the ionic profiles concentration profiles are equilibrium-like, but that's not generically true. If, if these diffusivities are not different, they, they are not the same, they are different, actually one has then an algebraic profile for, for this ionic uh, density or, uh, as we move away from the colloid and the rate of decay depends on this diffusion coefficient. So if beta is different from one, you break electroneutrality away from the colloid and therefore there is a bulk coupling that affects the motion of the colloidal particle. Actually, when one does the hydrodynamic model, the velocity at which the particle moves now uh, has uh, the standard Anderson terms plus now two extra ones that depend on this beta being different from one. And actually, uh, if this Q star is not very small, then very rapidly these terms dominate and okay, this is the mathematical expression. Uh, the important thing is that uh, also they have different symmetry in beta. So that has uh, uh, a strong influence in what is now the response of the self-propulsion as one changes the environment. So for example, this is the velocity as a function of the rate at which ions are produced. This is Anderson theory, and this is basically what we observe. And, as I said, if, if Q is small enough, then Anderson is a good approximation, but then uh, as we move away, then there is a clear difference and notice that the axis here is logarithmic. So that's an important effect. Uh, here I show you uh, the velocity computed as a function of, of this rate for different values of the chart of, of, the, of the colloid. And, and again, the open symbols is uh, Anderson. And it's not only that the magnitude may be different, here we wanted to emphasize that also the sign may change. So in this case, changing Q, we can go, we can reverse the direction of motion of the particle. So uh, the standard uh, way in which one uses Anderson for electro, the self-electrophoresis to, to decide which direction the colloid can move may not be, be true. And also another effect that we emphasize in this, in this picture is the fact that when Q becomes dominant, then this, this is, these are curves for different Kappa is the divide length. So this is different degrees of salt. We, we can change the amount of salt in the solvent. If, if the rate of production dominates, so it becomes large enough, at the end, the salt becomes irrelevant because the behavior is controlled by the ions released by the chemical reaction and not by the uh, salt of the medium, which then again is a way to say that the behavior of the particle decouples from the medium to some extent. And actually, this is something that was observed experimentally, and that was one of the reasons to look at it. So here is, is an experiment. I mean, these are, again, the velocity as a function now of the salt. In the experimental realization, they have one Q star. Changing the rate is, is non-trivial. But if you fix the rate and now you change the amount of salt, when the salt is weak, then essentially, so that when essentially the rate of production dominates, the velocity is not sensitive to the salt. So this is this regime I'm talking about. And then when salt dominates, then there is just a strong screening. And then we go back to the standard mechanism. The, if you want, the, these three uh, plots show you the, uh, the ionic concentration profiles around the colloid. Uh, in this region, see here when the salt dominates, these really profiles are 
the changes in profile are really uh, localized around the color. This is more like akin to uh, Anderson. Uh, uh, when motion dominates, then you can see how charge the ions can extend far beyond. And this is really this difference in qualitative behavior uh, depending on which mechanism dominates. Okay, so that's again uh, a clear signal of how the non equilibrium nature of the chemical reaction can influence not only the behavior surrounding the particle, but also distort and affect the medium far away in a significant way. And the final Ignazi, example, five minutes, yes, five minutes, five minutes yeah. okay, okay. So I think it will be enough. I, I wanted to then go one step beyond uh, and then introduce another uh, element that is relevant in, in some of these micro motors and which I think it's also in principle relevant um, biologically, which is to, now I, I've been talking about emphasizing the fact that one has this chemical reaction and this flux at the surface, which clearly sets the whole structure uh, in a non-equilibrium um, state. The reaction, uh, as I said, in the example of, of the previous uh, um, micro, micro motors, uh, the, there is this cap of platinum. So the enzyme, the, catal the, the, the catalyzer is fixed. Uh, but in, in, in other type of motors, for example, they are now, the, in order to make some of these micro motors that are uh, biological compatible, they, they move away from this uh, platinum coated uh, colloids and try to work with uh, urease and other enzymes, which then are uh, more biologically compatible. In that case, then these urease sometimes are basically um, attached to, uh, to a colloid in a way that they are not rigidly attached. They can move or they, there is certain mobility of this enzyme on the colloidal surface. So we again uh, wonder how that may impact the self-propulsion of these of these colloids uh, because again I imagine you consider a colloid uh, one of these uh, that where the with the enzymes attach and a certain degree of mobility. Uh, if, if the enzymes are um, homogeneously distributed, then there will be a chemical reaction going on. And again, we can write down the chemical reaction uh, as I did before. Uh, so here I have to talk about the concentration of the product, which is C as before. And now I have to talk about the concentration or the density of distribution of this urease or the enzyme on the colloidal surface. And this is gamma. So gamma is a surface density, surface concentration. And the mobility is again simplest uh, way to think about it is that it will exhibit a surface diffusion and if there is a local flow through a slip as we saw before that's something we have to take into account there can be an advection component and then a diffusive component and this diffusive component essentially is controlled by the chemical potential of the uh, urease on the particle and the simplest to say a kind of uh, saturating uh, contribution so there is a saturation or a maximum concentration and then there may be an attraction they, these, these proteins uh, could even, or these enzymes could even try to phase separate in the surface and, and then have more complex uh, contributions here for the chemical potential. That's something I do not take into account. I simply say, well, they can either attract or repel to see defect. And then there's always a, a cost to create gradients that, that could be uh, similar to sort of a line tension uh, if there would be a phase separation. Again, that's something that one could build in. That, that's, not, that's not what I will consider. I will consider the simplest case. And and then try to understand how this additional mobility can affect the uh, state of the system uh, in this uh, non-equilibrium state. So as, as we introduce a K-cut, as we introduce a reaction uh, that produces a certain chemical where, I mean, now proportionally to where we have these, these enzymes. And as before, the surface velocity will be proportional to uh, gradients of the produced chemical. So that's the same. The, the, the relevant parameter, I mean, again, uh, there is a ratio between the production and the diffusion that identifies a characteristic uh, velocity, uh, which uh, for in the case of urease, for example, in the experimental setups is of the order of 10 microns per second, uh, one can estimate it, yes. And then, uh, as you can imagine, if, if we are thinking in the role of the enzyme or the urease, for example, on the particles, then uh, an important parameter 
will be the competition between advection and diffusion. If we are in a purely symmetrical state, there is no velocity. Everything is purely diffusive. But if there is a way by which we can induce a flow, then uh, there is a number, a Peckley number, that will tell you how fast enzymes can diffuse, be uh, sorry, can be advected before the reorganization of the chemical or the, or the enzyme itself will take place. And if this Peckley is not small, then one can imagine that this is a source for instability. And, and this is indeed now, I mean, this whole scheme is relatively simple. I mean, uh, in, in the sense that starting from this uh, uh, homogeneous state, one can do a linear stability analysis. And basically one indeed identifies a critical Peckley number above which this homogeneous state becomes uh, unstable. And therefore the system can sustain a steady state in which the concentration of the urease or the, the enzyme is not homogeneous. And that in itself means that then the particle self propels. And uh, the, we, we characterize the nature of this uh, instability. So there is typically a critical Peckley number and there is a region where this, uh, we have a uh, subcritical tra uh, transition and then become supercritical. So I can have both scenarios and one can quantify that. Um, and actually, in, in that happens for pecklets around 10, 11, and, and that is uh, feasible for, for the experiments I was telling you. So we, we haven't made any comparison, but at least say the scenario is not um, um, unrealistic, say. Okay, so that's another, so as you see, I mean, it's, it's the, the nature of, of this kinetic, um, how the kinetics, the chemical reaction takes place and how that's coupled to the, to the details of, of the surface makes a role. Now you can imagine that if, if instead of being a, a color, you, you have uh, like a liposome or you have an object where you have a, a, a lipidic membrane, then the, the effect of this mobility and the coupling to the chemical reaction can play a central role to determine these scenarios for uh, self proportion of the mechanical response. So I think I will skip. I wanted to mention about collective effects, but maybe that's too much. So let me just uh, uh, move to the conclusions. So I, I've been looking at these chemical swimmers uh, as uh, model systems for active matter. And also these are relevant systems to, to produce uh, micro and nano robots. And basically I've tried to, to emphasize the relevance of looking at the nature of, of the chemical interactions and, and the role that the medium plays is not only the self diffusophoresis at the end that matters, is, is the gradients that they create the, them that are long range uh, that lead to uh, qualitatively different interactions from what the ones we know in equilibrium, in particular, for example, you can break action reaction and, and that is a mechanism to produce uh, emerging uh, rich variety of structures and also once you try to understand in more detail this, the, the structure and nature of, of these interactions of how they emerge, the fact that they are non-equilibrium is, is clearly relevant. And for example, I've shown you how isometric you should finish Ignacy. You should, you should finish at some point. Done, uh, and, yeah. So simply to thank collaborators. So Pietro and Joan have been involved in the first part and Marco, Samuel in Ibeck and Marina Arroyo in Polytechnic University to the last one about more the, the specific mechanisms and thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much Ignazi for this uh, beautiful presentation and talk. And it's time for questions uh, from our audience. As I remind you that if you want to ask a question, you just have to say in the text, in the chat, I have a question with your name and that's all. Um, I don't see any question actually. I, I now one question by, Juan Aragonés, please go ahead. Hi, nice talk, Ignacio. Uh, I think I didn't get it about these um, apolar swimmers uh, or apolar active uh, uh, particles. How So they end up uh, pointing towards the substrate, right? Yes. So they generate these, uh, these flows, right? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, so they, um, they, they point towards the substrate, so that's why they don't propel. Yes. Uh, but then because they are active, they create, I mean, they, they produce uh, 
uh, or they consume, say, the, the oxygen peroxide, if you want to think about it. So there is a depletion of oxygen peroxide. So there is a concentration profile of this oxygen peroxide that extends far from the active particle itself. So um, I guess that because of this field uh, depends on the C direction now. Yes, in principle, yes. Yeah. It will have an impact the 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 height of your channel, right? If you play with the with the height, you can even switch that interaction, right? Yes. So, no, you're right. I I didn't go so much into detail into that. Indeed, in the in the experiments, the this, the, the perpendicular, the z direction is, is, is large compared to the particles. Not yes. too large, but large. So at the end, in these experiments, you can think of it as a, as a monolayer, where indeed, I mean, the profiles are 3D, but because the particles are essentially uh, moving on, on, uh, on the same layer, it is the, the transversal uh, component of the field that matters. Uh, but it's true that even, even in that case, now if you start uh, screening it, you will affect this lateral profile and therefore you will uh, modify the interactions. Uh, whether you can change the sign in this case, I don't know. Definitely the magnitude, that's something we didn't look, but indeed, I mean, that's another example of how the, the fact that it's a, me a medium mediated interaction, which is long range, it will be sensitive to the overall geometry. Yeah. So really cool. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. There is another question by Amit Singh. Maybe you can say your affiliation. Hi, uh, I'm from Institute Curie. I had a okay. question about the enzyme bit and specifically about the rotational diffusion of the enzymes and how should it relate to the uh, reaction rates to get actually uh, motion? So when you say rotational diffusion, you, you mean diffusion along the membrane or really the, rotation uh, diffusion, diffusion of the, the whole itself. enzyme, uh, the rotation of the enzyme. Yeah, so actually, again, that, that's something we did not explore. We, we focus on the role of the diffusion of the, of the uh, protein along the, sub, uh, so the membrane. And that's because we were thinking in, in these experiments, typically these uh, proteins are uh, attached through an intermediate molecule to, to okay. the um, to the surface, so that hinders the rotational diffusion itself. I see. But uh, there may be other cases where then you will you can have a rotational diffusion. That that would be an additional mechanism. Mm -hmm. uh, to lowest order, I would think that if uh, unless there is a very strong correlation, this rotational diffusion could affect what is the the mean effective, uh, say for example, K cat of of the, of the proteins themselves. So the, so the question essentially was because the KCAT is, uh, if I remember correctly, it's very close to the uh, rotational diffusion time scale. So the reactions are happening at the same time scale, which is um, uh, microseconds, uh, which is the same roughly the time for the rotational diffusion for a free enzyme. So I was wondering if uh, this catalytic reaction can also somehow slow down the um, rotational diffusion or what sort of effect do they have on rotational diffusion? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, that, that's an interesting point. I, indeed, I mean, in principle, you're right. Uh, we, we did not uh, looked into that. The experiments I were referring to, I think in that case, this, mm. this particular motion is, uh, effect is hindered. But, but in principle, it should be also included. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I see uh, there are no more questions. We have uh, still three minutes left. Uh, let me ask you a brief uh, question for you, Ignazi. Uh, so I have a curiosity about these sort of equations uh, for the motion of the particles in the presence of these concentration gradients. And, and so do you use some sort of, all these solutions are um, sort of uh, mean field equations that use some sort of Poisson-Boltzmann approximation? Uh, is, that, is this true? Yeah, I mean, this, this is mean field, so it's a continuum approach. Um, in equilibrium, is Poisson-Boltzmann. Uh, otherwise, it's just this, you, you write down the corresponding uh, equations for the diffusion advection uh, that correspond to, to the ions. And then we solve them. Yeah, I, I didn't go into that. We uh, basically solve them numerically. So the results I've been showing you correspond to, to that, indeed. I see. So, and the different type of systems, the kind of systems that you can approach with these equations. So you mentioned, I think in the beginning, photoactive 
systems. And in, at the end, you mentioned uh, reactive systems, enzymatic reactions mm -hmm. on the surface of the particles. Um, what type, there, there, were, there were also magnetic systems at some point, this was your, uh, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the work you, you show with uh, Pietro Tierno. Can you summarize a little bit which, ki which kind of particles, modified particles, uh, are used to, 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 to implement this activity? Just a brief mm -hmm. overview, let's say, uh, summarizing the different mm -hmm. kind of experimental systems that have been, that can be applied, uh, that can be studied. Uh, so, so basically the, the photoactive, um, as such, is, is a way to, the, the, the activity of the light is to, to enhance the effectivity of the uh, catalyst. Uh, as such, is, it's a colloid that, that moves through diffusophoresis, is the decomposition of oxygen peroxide. It's true that the underlying particle has a dipolar, a magnetic dipolar component. Um, we do not exploit or, I mean, the dipolar component does not play a, a, an important role in terms of the activity of the interaction. It has a secondary role. I mean, this is just because of the experimental setup, but I don't think it's, it's uh, crucial to what I described. I would say, on the one hand, there is this uh, self diffuser for uh, the decomposition of oxygen peroxide, which is one of the model systems that we heard about. And then the others are moving into this uh, college that self-propel by exploiting enzymes. And then here we have, for example, I was referring to urease because it's uh, one that is being uh, started quite a lot because of the biocompatibility of urease. In the case of urease, typically the, uh, again, it's, it's also a chemical reaction as for the decomposition of the oxygen peroxide. But then in this case for the urease, then the products are half a charge. And then one has to take into account the fact that there are ions, okay? But I would say in both cases are reactive and that's generic. But what is the aspect of the reactivity that matters is different in these two type of uh, experimental realizations. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much, Ignazi, for your presentation you. and for your nice contribution. And uh, we then uh, pass to the next speaker um, of this session. The next speaker of uh, this session um, is going to be uh, Miguel Ruiz Garcia from Penn University and also I UPM, I presume it's Polytechnic University of Madrid. And he will talk about spontaneous hemodynamic fluctuations, the brain vasculature as an out of equilibrium flow network. Uh, I pass you the word, Miguel, you can start whenever you are ready. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. I hope that you can hear me well because my connection before was a bit uh, laggy, but uh, just let me know if you don't hear me at some point. So, okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I will start now at you know, uh, Universidad Politecnica de Madrid. So I'm very happy to, to join this conference that is in Madrid, but it's online, but still is very nice. And I, I'm really thankful for the organizer to, to let me talk today. So I will jump ahead and do a very brief introduction about flow networks. And I just want to say here that they are everywhere. So every time that we think about them, we are thinking about many different systems, like they can be, for example, rivers, which are distributing water. They can be car, like streets that distribute the cars around a city, or they can even be your own vessels. And the only idea that I want to give you here is that they assist and they are everywhere because they are much more efficient at diffusion and at distributing matter around. And then we can also think about the flows inside a network and you know they can be stationary and still uh, distribute matter or nutrients but they can also be dynamic. So I'm going to show you here two examples. This example is by Sarum. It's a video by Mark Duran. Um, so you can see that by peristaltic movements, the flow is like dynamics and you have like different uh, volume at different times. And this system that we are gonna talk more in the next slides uh, is a video by Patrick Drew at Penn State. And uh, the colors here uh, tell you how much blood volume it's in each vessel. And actually you are looking through a window uh, to the mouse surface arterial network. So you actually are looking at how much blood uh, is in the, in the vessels of the, of, of the brain of a, of a mouse. 
And I can tell you a little bit more about this experiment. Actually, it's a, a bit scary, but they, they are able to, to put a window on the skull of these mice. Um, they also have an electrode that measures what is the neural activity of a region of the brain, and what is the blood volume in that region. Um, in this case, the, the mouse is active, is doing mouse stuff, you know. Um, so the neural activity is oscillating, the blood volume is also oscillating, and these oscillations are, are correlated, right? It makes a lot of sense, right? If the, if the brain is active and is doing stuff, it needs blood, um, so you see blood oscillate. What it was much more striking to us and what motivated our work is that they can actually shut down all the neural activity, right? So they can infuse some medicine, some chemical here, now the neural activity is completely zero and still you see fluctuations, right? Now, of course, they are not correlated to this because this is zero all the time. Um, so and, and this was really interesting to us, right? Because this is suggesting that at least a part of this rest state uh, fluctuation, uh, hemodynamic fluctuations are from a non-neuronal -neuro origin. And we wanted to understand what would be the most simple model that would give us this, right? Like some waves of vo volume accumulation that uh, appear spontaneously. So we did some basic res research of the literature. And of course, this is a very complex topic, like the physics of blood flow. And I'm not going to go through all the details because we are only interested in some basic properties that would give us the behavior that we are looking for to explain. And actually what we found, and we thought that it was key for our purpose, is that if we look at one vessel and control the pressure difference between the entrance and the exit, the flow through this vessel is highly nonlinear. Right? At the beginning it's gonna increase as you increase the pressure difference, and then actually decreases and then increases again. And this is the experiment where they actually plot their, their, their data in a different way, like shear stress uh, and flow response, but I pre-plotted it in this way because it's more useful for us. So just to keep in mind this highly nonlinear relation between flow and pressure difference. And there is a, a second ingredient that I think is more intuitive is that when we have more flow going into a region of the vessel that is going out of it, we will have a volume accumulation because the fluid is incompressible. And then when you have a volume accumulation, it means that you are deforming the vessel and you are also deforming the external medium, right? Whatever it's outside the, the vessel the tissue basically. Uh, I think it's intuitive to see, like if you look at this toy displacement field, that the pressure here will increase, but it will also increase far away. And I can be a little more quantitative, and um, take a block of tissue, I will clamp the boundary conditions all around the boundary, and I will leave a gap with a free surface. And if now I impose an external pressure on this uh, surface, I will deform the medium. Um, if I look at the response of the medium in this bottom boundary, uh, on the free surface, of course, is the same, is opposite to what I'm imposing because it's at equilibrium. But if you look at the, the pressure that the medium is imposing on the rest of the boundary, uh, it has like a long range decay and it depends on the Poisson ratio elastic properties of the mining. So, so these are the two ingredients that we think are really important and we can now make a model of our flow network, right? I'm going to plot the, the results always in this way. So I will be measuring the volume at each node so that, you know, when we have volume concentration or accumulation, uh, we think about it like being in the nodes. And we also compute the pressure at every node. Um, when we plot it like this, for example, this is a plot of the pressure in the whole network. Uh, we plot the pressure uh, in every node with the color around it, right? So here, for example, I have like a constant pressure, high pressure here, a constant zero pressure here. And this is the, the color map gives you the pres pressure field. And now we have to think about the, the flows. Um, so we did something relatively simple is that the flow through a vessel depends on the difference between, uh, of pressure between the, the entrance and the exit. Um, it may be linear or it may be nonlinear as the one that we saw before. And then there is 
a second equation that is telling us that when we have a volume accumulation in one node, like when the volume at this node is larger than some rest volume, this is coupled to the pressure. Uh, it can be in two ways. Imagine that this is zero first and you only have like this identity matrix, then it's completely local, right? When you have more volume in one node, the pressure increases only there. But if this is zero and this is the graph Laplacian, something you can think in the continuous limit like a normal Laplacian, then you would have like a Poisson equation, right? Like a point charge, so to speak. And then that would give you the long range uh, response of the pressure that we are looking for. So I, I'm going fast, but you know, we can talk later or even offline. Um, so let's look at some results, right? For example, this was the first result that we really liked because we, we thought that it's going the right direction. Uh, it's kind of counterintuitive. So here we are imposing a constant pressure difference, right? So if you look, I will play it now. And if you look at these colors of these nodes, they're always the same color. But uh, so it's a, you can imagine that it's like a constant DC battery, right? But then if you look at the pressure uh, field or the volume, uh, they are very dynamic, right? Actually, you have like volume accumulation here that triggers uh, a pulse and the pulse travel to the other contact and recycle. So you have like self-sustained oscillations for a, a I, I'm gonna stress this, right? Like for a constant, uh, external pressure difference between the, the, the two contacts. So we really like this. and We thought that this resembles like some properties of ex excitable media. And we, th we thought to try to show this with one uh, simulation. So what we did, I'm showing you here now the pressure at the, it's, it's a different network. It's like a very long network. Um, and we are imposing uh, the external pressure at the blue and red nodes. I'm gonna show you the pressure at this node with time in this bottom panel. This is the current that is going in and out of the system through these nodes. It's not too important right now. And what I want you to see is like in this case, this is a, a different uh, pressure different so that if I impose this pressure different, this is like a stationary uh, situation, right? It's like you could say it is at equilibrium, even though you have like a constant, constant flow through the, through the network. But what happens like when we introduce this perturbation, you actually trigger a pulse, right? And this pulse is traveling pretty much like you would expect in other excitable media. And then when the pulse reaches the end, you go back to your stationary solution. If I move it forward, I can also trigger another pulse with another perturbation. And the nice thing is like, if I try to trigger a second pulse, because there is already one pulse traveling, almost nothing happens. Uh, you just have to wait until this reaches the end and you go back to your stationary solution. So this is like an effective uh, refractory time. Um, you have perturbations that take you through a, a large escarchion in phase space. So we think that this kind of numerically proves that this is an excitable medium, but remember, it is not excitable because every element is excitable, right? It, it is like a collective uh, phenomenon. So I can show you more examples. I'm gonna go fast through this. Uh, so if I put like a region of linear edges here, the, the pulses uh, kind of jump there, which is also similar to, to phenomenon that you can see in other excitable media. And now I want to be a, a little bit more quantitative. And what I'm gonna do is like, I'm gonna study the frequency of the oscillations depending on different changes to the network. Uh, the, the changes that I'm gonna do, I'm gonna change the position or the distance between the sources. I'm gonna introduce more linear edges or I'm, can, I'm gonna make shortcuts. And for all these changes, what happens like the frequency increases and the amplitude decreases. And we can be quantitative, like we do 100 simulations for every point. And as the distance of the sources, uh, decreases, the, um, the frequency increases, the more shortcuts you have also increases, the more linear edges also the frequency increases. But these are very different axes, right? So the question now would be like, you know, can, can we collapse all these curves, right? Can, can we translate all these dif so different, like very different changes to the structure of the network to the same quantity? Of course, if I am asking this question in a talk, it's because the answer is yes. Um, the way that 
I want you to understand it intuitively is like as we include more shortcuts, for example, the network is effectively becoming shorter. And the way that you can try to understand this or quantify it actually is like if you have a random walk, in this case, like a random fish who is lost in this network is gonna jump randomly from one place to another. So the more shortcuts you have, the easier it is to get to this point before coming back to the initial point. And this is the escape probability of a random walk. You can compute it. And with this, we define this effective distance uh, that is, it can be defined for shortcuts, for linear edges, or for changing the distance between the sources. And now we can plot the frequencies for all these six, uh, cases and they collapse in the, in the same plot. So we are pretty happy about this. Right? Um, of course, this is pretty theoretical, right? We were motivated by the brain. We are still working with uh, Patrick Drew at uh, Penn State. Hopefully we will have some experiments at some point with you know, mice and so on. But you know, we also thought, why not to try to build this ourselves in a lab, right? Uh, also, that way we don't touch uh, so many mice. And the idea is the following. And you have two minutes, Miguel. Okay, great. Two minutes. Uh, so the, the idea is the following, and this is in, in collaboration with Alejandro Martinez Calvo, with his, uh, who is at the Universidad Carlos III in Madrid, and Karen Jensen, who is uh, at Denmark, and uh, hopefully will do the experiment. So all these simulations are by Alejandro. Uh, I told you that we needed these two ingredients, right? Like first, a non-linearity that uh, changing the, the pressure difference you have a flow that hopefully goes up, down, and up again. And this is actually not too hard to, to achieve. And the way that we do it, it's like this. We have two beams that op oppose the pressure difference. So as the pressure difference increase, they close and up again. So you, you can pretty easily achieve this re relationship. And the second thing that we need is uh, this relation between volume accumulation and pressure, right? I want that when I have a volume accumulation, the external medium deforms and affect other regions as far away from my volume accumulation. And we think we, we can achieve this, having exactly that, right? Like having like an external medium that deforms. And now we can try to put everything together, right? So I, we did this array. It's, it would be like the 1D case of the simulation that we showed you. So we would like to see a volume accumulation pulse traveling from left to right for constant boundary conditions, and hopefully the pulse will reach the end and recycle. So uh, we didn't get there yet, right? So this is a work in progress, so any suggestions are welcome. Uh, what happens, like, we actually see the pulse traveling from left to right, right? I, I'm gonna play it again. So you see there is a pulse, like a, 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 oh, sorry. a volume accumulation that has traveled, but now it gets stuck. Um, we, think, we think that we know what is happening. Is like, this is very sensitive to the boundary conditions of the external medium. And because it is incompressible, actually it's, it's squeezing the last chamber. And this is triggering a pulse in the wrong direction and they, they meet here and get stuck. So we still have to figure out how to solve this. We think we know how and hopefully you know, maybe next year I can show you some nice experiments done by Kare in Denmark. Uh, so that's it. With this, I want to thank the organizers again, like thank uh, the funding during this time, um, the collaborations, the collaborators in this work, and we'll leave here my conclusions and I will take any questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Miguel, for this interesting talk. And um, I think we have some question now. Daniel Sarf from Yale University, please go ahead. Hi, Miguel. Thank you. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, I was wondering uh, if you could talk about maybe what the role of the network connectivity is in these networks. Um, it seems like you have mostly a, a triangular lattice, but what happens when you change yeah. the connectivity of the nodes and stuff? Okay, okay, uh, no, uh, great question. I think I went too far through this. Like, yeah, you're right. Like we kind of have like something like a disordered triangular lattice. So here the connectivity is around five, five and a half. Um, so we think at least for the frequency of the oscillations, uh, the role of the connectivity, you can capture it 
using this effective distance, right? I, I'm gonna go through it like uh, very quickly again, but basically as you change the topology of the network, of the connectivity of it, right? Um, it is not only important how neighbors, how many uh, neighbors you are connected to, it's also important how far away they are, and, and you can capture this in a qualitative way using this uh, escape probability of a random walk. And now, at least with this, for the frequency, we think it captured, you know, most of the uh, variance of the frequency depending on, on, on the topology or connectivity of the net. But yeah, like, for example, for the amplitude, it doesn't work that way, right? So there are more things to, to, to do there. Okay, so it's a connection of the uh, link length as well as the connectivity. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any more question? Uh, yeah, Juan Aragonés from Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. Please go ahead. Uh, really nice, Miguel, uh, but maybe I miss it, but when, uh, when you have these uh, this forces uh, propagating, have you include any damping constant or anything that takes into account that maybe you are dissipating energies uh, while the, the pulse is propagating uh, through, through that media? Yeah, okay, it is a very good question. Uh, okay, I, yeah, no, it's very good. I, I guess that you may have in mind, like, oh, what would be like a, reaction diffusion, like continuing model uh, equation for this, right? Yeah. Um, and we can talk more about this. I, I Related to, to dissipation, I would say that you have dissipation all the time, right? Because I have like this relation between flow and pressure difference, right? Like, okay, it's not linear, but you know, if it, 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 it is, here, it's the DCP, the, it's basically the definition of your dissipation, right? Like the, depending yes. on the pressure difference that you have, the more flow you have, like the less dissipation on the other way around. Um, I guess that the key point here is like, you are connected to a battery, so to speak, like, or a pump of pressure. You are, you are always uh, in, injecting energy. Yes. So there is dissipation, but you are also always injecting energy. And no. for some range of the parameter, you have these pulses and they can travel. And, you know, they are happy traveling because, you know, they, they are dissipating energy, but they are also getting energy from, some, for, from the source. And of course, in other regions of the parameters, like, for example, when I talk about this sample of excitability, here there are no pulses, right? Uh, I, I need to trigger it so to see it. Uh, in, in other regions, I cannot trigger a pulse because probably it's because of what you say, because probably they would dissipate too much compared to how much energy is going. So I didn't do a, a systematic study of that, but I think that you are in the right uh, direction. Cool. Thank you very much, Miguel. Thank you. Okay, so I think we are, uh, we are much on time, just a bit three minutes uh, in the day, but it's fine. Uh, we can move to the next uh, speaker. We thank, thank you very much. again uh, Miguel Ruiz for his very nice talk and we move to our next speaker um, who will be Daniel Sierra um, from Yale University and he will talk about irreversibility and synchronization in reaction diffusion oscillators. Please go ahead, uh, uh, Daniel, whenever, whenever you want, you can start. Great, okay. So um, thank you everybody for, for having me. Um, I'll try to stay on time to keep, not keep you from lunch or breakfast for me. I'm in the United States. Um, as uh, Felix said, I'm Daniel Sayada. I'm a grad student at Yale University in the physics department working with um, Michael Morell. And uh, today I'm going to be telling you about uh, a, a project collaborating between myself, my advisor, and uh, Ben Mokta, another professor at Yale. Um, so I think I don't have to explain to this audience uh, everything that biology does by consuming energy and by driving itself out of equilibrium, everything from cell division all the way on the left, a very vital life process that seems obviously out of equilibrium, something maybe a little less intuitive in the center here where we see, we're seeing swarming bacteria actually um, inducing phase separation, actually behaving like equilibrium droplets or um, 
my personal favorite, all the way on the right, uh, we're seeing a video of a uh, sheepdog um, herding a flock of sheep. And in this case, you can think of this system as a model where the dog is attracted to the sheep, but the sheep is repelled away from the dog. And this kind of run and chase dynamics is impossible in equilibrium, uh, so-called with the so-called uh, non-reciprocal interactions. Um, and uh, importantly, in all these cases, and in many cases in biology, these these uh, evo these dynamics are not just over don't only occur over time, but they also occur over space. Um, and uh, nowhere, I think, is this more striking than in embryogenesis. Uh, so if we're looking at, say, the um, synchronized uh, cell division during the beginning developmental uh, phases of, the, uh, of a frog, of a xenopus oocyte, um, we see that um, many cells, uh, up to hundreds of cells, will spontaneously and, and uh, at the same time divide uh, uh, into smaller and smaller segments. Um, and this is also borne out when we look at the actual uh, proteins underlying cell division, specifically F-actin, part of the cell cytoskeleton, um, that induces uh, uh, that induces the cell division. But we see these very um, coordinated pulsed waves along the cortex of the cell as well. Um, and so uh, we were inspired by these types of experiments and sought to ask um, what is the energetic or in the case of biology metabolic costs of, of synchronization. Um, in order to do this, we have to measure um, irreversibility of these spatially extended systems. Um, so uh, the basic idea is um, uh, we turn to uh, stochastic thermodynamics as many people do nowadays. Um, and the idea is that if you start out with some initial distribution of your of your system uh, given by this blue blob on the left, uh, you can watch it evolve over some particular path to some final distribution after some time t goes to the red blob. And then you can ask how likely am I to see that exact reverse uh, trajectory from the from the from the end distribution to the beginning. And then um, back uh, you know, uh, uh, in 2007, um, it was uh, a particular form for writing the sound uh, was given uh, that directly um, measured the how likely you are to see a, a, a trajectory in the forward direction given by p uh, with um, compared to the reverse tra uh, trajectory, which is given by t tilde. Um, and this has uh, this is connections to information theoretic quantities. It's called the callback libre divergence. Um, and this gives us a measure of entry production rate, which is a uh, distance from equilibrium that's been introduced in the very first talk of today's um, session. Um, so uh, what we did was made a uh, rather simple uh, guess for uh, what we could put into this probability distribution in order to get, uh, in order to get um, information out. So our assumptions on our degrees of freedom is that they're scalar. Um, they're even under time reversal. So things like positions or chemical concentrations and not necessarily velocities. And most importantly, that they follow Gaussian dynamics. And specifically, uh, we can write down the path probability distribution functional um, in this form, where Z is a vector composed of all of our degrees of freedom. And uh, I want to get, point your attention to uh, this uh, covariance matrix C that is, um, that is in the action of this, of this exponential, um, which is basically measuring the, co the, co the correlations between every pair of degrees of freedom. Um, when you plug in this probability distribution, it's Gaussian, as most things that are Gaussian is actually solvable, uh, we can write down the entropy production rate purely in terms of correlation functions, purely in terms of just taking uh, two or more de uh, degrees of freedom, finding their correlations in time and space. Uh, we work in frequency space uh, because it turns out to be easier. Um, and the entry production rate is a, an integral over all frequencies of this particular quantity, uh, which as I said, is only a function of the correlations. Um, we can uh, package up this whole uh, this whole quantity into one variable, um, which we call the entropy production factor because it's kind of similar to a dynamic structure factor um, in that it gives us information about this about irreversibility happening at uh, different time scales and length scales q and omega, um, and we can actually show that um, this 
this quantity, it measures the statistical irreversibility in your signals, um, but it all, and it also produ uh, provides a lower bound on the entry production rate if Gaussian dynamics are not the dynamics that your system obeys, which is very probable for, um, for biological systems. Um, and so uh, we are able to we we are able to test this on a on a on a whole bunch of different simulations of different kinds of dynamics um, uh, systems that obeyed linear dynamics on the, uh, that are shown on the left the Gaussian approximation is actually exact and gives us the the entry production rate exactly and the nonlinear dynamics on the right it gives us a lower bound um, and in all cases it actually works fairly well. Um, I'm showing the entry production rate as a function of distance from equilibrium and all these plots where the red lines are what we get from theory or directly out of simulations and then the black dots are um, what we measure uh, with our basically our estimator the, with the entry production factor and then integrating it. Um, and so this works well for a wide variety of data, um, everything from spatially extended fields at the bottom to uh, individual degrees of freedom that only change in time on the top. Um, uh, but just to focus on a particular set of dynamics, I'm going to focus on the, this reaction diffusion system uh, to, to get to the question of synchronization. Um, in our lab, we're very interested in not just measuring dissipation, but also seeing what can we learn by measuring dissipation? What new information do we get? So we turn to uh, the brusculator, which is a very um, prototypical model for biochemical oscillations that obey these reaction, uh, these reaction equations on the left. Uh, we track the two intermediate chemical species, X and Y, and everything else that's in black is kept constant. So A, B, and C uh, are treated as chemostats. And then by measuring uh, how much this system breaks detailed balance, we get a, 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 a a quantity that gives us the distance from equilibrium or the chemical driving force that drives the system out of equilibrium. Um, then if we simulate this, uh, this system on a one-dimensional ring by having these reactions on individual lattice sites, uh, we get the, these types of dynamics that, we, that I'm showing here, uh, simulation on the left and um, the, uh, space, the space time plot on the right or a chymograph. Um, uh, and we see that uh, uh, at, a at a certain driving force, at a certain delta mu, uh, the system undergoes a Hopf bifurcation, which is normally uh, the a bifurcation that signals the beginning of limit cycles or oscillatory behavior. But uh, in our case, when we add uh, diffusion between lattice sites, we don't only get oscillations, but we also get synchronized oscillations in these uh, in these reactions uh, diffusion systems. And we get some some examples of wave-like behavior that we see on the on the chymograph on the right. Um, so uh, we can measure uh, the synchronization using the an order parameter um, from the that's usually used in the Kuramoto model. Uh, so we turn these dynamics in x and y into um, into phase into phases, and then are able to measure the synchronization using that uh, order parameter. Um, and what we see is that uh, below uh, the point where you get the hop bifurcation, which is the red dotted line, uh, the dynamics look very noisy and very incoherent, and that's reflected in the order parameter that uh, is very low. And then as you approach this hop bifurcation, uh, we get to synchronized oscillations that I was showing before, and this order parameter approaches one. Um, and as we increase the uh, system size, so as we increase the reaction volume of every uh, of every lattice site, uh, this actually approaches a discontinuous transition, um, where the lowest system size is in blue here, medium is in orange, and then the highest is in green. Um, and this this uh, has uh, previous work has found that um, in systems of coupled oscillators, uh, odd dimensions tend to have discontinuous phase transitions. Um, and so we wanted to see if the irreversibility or entry production rate um, reflects this transition to, to synchronized behavior. Um, so first, as we said before, um, uh, the, our estimate captures the entry production rate pretty well, but it turns out that the entry production rate uh, tends to have this uh, 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 the same discontinuity regardless of the regardless of whether there's synchronization or not. 
So if we um, measure the entry production rate as a function of system volume again, we again see this sharpening uh, towards a discontinuous transition. Uh, and this is with the fusion between the lattice sites, but we cut off the fusion and there's no more, no, uh, the, the um, lattice sites can no longer communicate with each other. We actually get the very similar behavior. Um, and in fact, when we measure the um, magnitude of the maximum slope uh, of this entry production rate as it's, uh, as the system size gets larger, we actually get that it follows the same power law, um, that it increases as a function of the system volume roughly to the, to the five fourths. Um, uh, and so, uh, our conclusion is that the entry production rate uh, actually measures the, um, start of oscillations, but not necessarily synchronization. Um, and uh, I don't quite have an explanation for this five-fourths power law. And if anybody has any ideas, I would love to love to hear about it. Um, uh, instead, so now we turn to the integrand of this equation that gave us the entry production rate, uh, this entry production factor. Um, I'm putting it at the top again here, um, just to uh, just to remind you, and actually writing out explicitly what the covariance matrix is. Um, and uh, so building it up, uh, we, when we have uh, below, when we're below the hop bifurcation, we have these very incoherent dynamics. Um, and the entry production factor looks like this. Uh, it's a function of, again, Q and omega. Um, I'm showing the marginals along both Q and omega on the top and on the right. Um, and what I want to point out is that uh, at this, uh, at this uh, kind of dynamics, the entry production factor uh, has peaks at very high wave numbers or very short wavelengths. So it's saying that the the dissipation or the irreversibility is really coming from, uh, from very short short length scale dynamics. Um, as we cross the bifurcation, uh, we get um, dynamics that are more synchronized and more ordered. Um, and as you might expect, the entry production factor is going to look pretty different. Um, and uh, we actually see that the entry production factor, the peaks of uh, along the wave vector along Q um, actually shift towards low wave numbers. Um, and uh, so the end this reflects, so saying that the irreversibility is happening over long, longer length scales. Daniel, um, two, two minutes, Daniel. Perfect. Um, so, uh, yeah, so when we measure the actual um, wave vector that uh, maximizes the EPS, we get a curve that looks something like this, where at uh, low driving at a, at, at, uh, before the hot bifurcation, again shown in the red dotted line, um, the EPS is maximized at very high wave numbers or short wavelengths. And then as you reach the hot bifurcation, everything drops down to actually the zero wave vector, meaning it's at system, system size scale. Um, and again, this, 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 uh, this transition gets sharper um, as the system size increases, although not as sharp, uh, not as dramatically as the order parameter did. Um, but still, it uh, verifies for us that um, this entry production factor carries the signatures of synchronization by it, uh, as seen by its shift in the peak of the entry production factor, um, rather than the entry production rate. Um, so uh, that's that's all I wanted to say. So in conclusion, we introduced uh, a new measure for estimating entry production rates from data, which is given by integrating this entry production factor. Um, we uh, this entry production factor is uh, accurately estimates the entry production rate from many different kinds of data, from uh, driven Brownian particles um, shown here on the left, where the Gaussian approximations make this an exact expression, or very nonlinear spatially extended systems like the reaction diffusion system on the right, and we used it to um, to understand uh, what happens during this hot bifurcation, where we found that the entry production rate has signatures of creation of oscillations and the entry production factor gives us more information about the synchronization. Um, future directions, um, uh, both from the modeling side and from the data side, from the modeling side, we're trying to go beyond 
the Gaussian approximation, which is a pretty strict, uh, pretty strict requirement, um, and this involves some fun perturbation theory that you can uh, try to write down. It's messy, and I don't have anything fully done, but um, I like these, I like these pictures. Um, and uh, we're also really looking to apply these to experiments again with the idea of what, what can we really learn uh, about biology by measuring the, these quantities so if you have any data that you think this would be useful for um, i would be happy to to talk um, and so with that uh, you can find the paper on the archive it's currently in review um, i worked this project with michael morell and ben makta um, and I have to thank all the smart friends that I get to talk to about this kind of stuff and people to support me and thank you for your attention. Okay, um, thank you very much, Daniel, uh, Bob, for this beautiful talk. So let's uh, go to the questions in the chat. There is one question by Miguel Ruiz from Penn University and Polytechnic University of Madrid. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank yeah, thank you, you very much. Miguel. Okay, uh, you can hear me. Right? Th thank you. Yeah. So I had a um, question about like when you see this phase transition with the order parameter, it's yeah. getting steeper and steeper. Uh -huh. uh, did you see any hysteresis? Like if you go from the left to the right and then from the right to the left? Um, we didn't specifically look at that, so I can't say I can't say for sure. Um, so what what I can say is we didn't continuously change the order parameter for a single simulation. We uh, sort of looked at the steady state behavior uh, at a fixed uh, set of parameters, and so there wasn't any dynamic uh, oh, dynamic okay. changing of the of the order parameter. But that would be something that would be something very interesting to to look at. Okay, or even in the in the case that you are doing, you never saw like maybe. Uh, starting from different initial conditions, like sometimes you go to one branch and sometimes you go to another. You didn't see that. So actually, sometimes at sort of in uh, this region, uh, very close to the bifurcation, where the order parameter is somewhere around a half, what you'll see are sort of intermittent dynamics, where you see little bursts of, of uh, synchronized behavior and then surrounded by asynchronous behavior, and then it, that will die out, and you'll see sort of these uh, little. Um, sort of puffs of, of, of organized oscillations. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Miguel. And Patrick has another question yeah. uh, from the Cambridge. Talk. Excellent talk. Thank you, Daniel. I'm really course, thank you. by your, by your uh, bound on the entropy production. Right. So you said it, uh, it's a bound. It's, of course, not exact. So I guess you, you're getting a difference when uh, you have a hidden degrees of freedom that also produce entropy. Exactly. Now I'm wondering, do you still need to have, uh, for the observable degrees of freedom, do you need to have a Gaussian uh, correlation for them? So, so no. Um, so, uh, so the, well, so there's, there's a couple of different lower bounds that are happening. One is if there's hidden degrees of freedom, which regardless of what probability distribution you put into the callback lively divergence, you're always going to get a lower bound um, yes. uh, based on not yeah, having all the degrees yeah. of freedom. Sorry? Yeah, I see. But it's more than that, you say. That's really intriguing. Yes. And th so then the second is like, okay, assuming that we have all of the degrees of freedom, what if we assume they are Gaussian? That itself also puts a lower bound on the entry production rate for the observable degrees of freedom. So the Gaussian assumption itself and definitely for the, the for the brusselator and this reaction diffusion system, it is not Gaussian dynamics. Maybe uh, closer to equilibrium, it might be, or might, could you know be a justifiable approximation. But definitely in the high in these above the hop bifurcation, you do not that is not Gaussian at all. And our argument is that uh, we capture um, something like ten to twenty percent of the entry production rate, but we still get the, the salient behavior, namely this sort of shift in the entry production rate as you go to above the bifurcation. Okay, I guess- the um, I'd be happy to involved. talk to you more about the bounds as well. I guess the proof is quite involved if you want to prove it even uh, beyond the Gauss regime. Um, right, uh, the, the proof was really based on uh, something called the uh, information processing inequality, uh, which says that you cannot transform variables and gain more information. Um, and then the idea is to um, is to come up with a transformation that kills all of your uh, correlations except for your two point correlations. So then, if you start out 
described by some probability distribution with many moments perform some uh, uh, perform a transformation that uh, uh, that kill all the higher moments except the first two, then you're left with a Gaussian. And so then that has to lower your um, the callback library divergence and thus the irreversibility. I see. Thank you. Okay. okay. So there is another question by Amit. Thank you, Patrick, anyway. <laughs> Hi, um, I just wanted to ask a little bit about uh, the measure that you showed for entropy production. Uh, how yes. is it different from the uh, Hardasasa relation, which is the difference of fluctuation and response, which is the- uh, Right. So, um, so the Hardasasa um, uh, relation, um, uh, as far as I understand, is exact for, for, all, for all dynamics um, and involves the difference between the correlation functions and the response functions. In this case, we have no response functions. Everything is measured in terms of correlation functions. Um, this has the benefit that in experimental uh, cases, it's easier to measure the correlation functions from observing data than it is to measure response functions where you need to actually perturb the system. The cost is that we get, a we get only get a lower bound. Um, but it is possible to show that uh, uh, this entry production factor actually is exactly equal to the Harada Sasa equality for, um, for dynamics that follow Gaussians. Um, so uh, I didn't talk about these driven Gaussian fields, mm -hmm. but um, uh, it's uh, sort of model A dynamics uh, in, term, in, in these types of simulations and actually are able to show that the entry production factor, which we can calculate analytically because it's very simple dynamics, um, actually follows, it measures uh, the same exact thing that the Harada Sasa equality does. But that's only in the Gaussian case. So for the nonlinear case, um, they are not equal. If you are able to measure the correlate, both the correlation function and the response function for the nonlinear case, you would probably get a tighter bound. But um, I think it's fairly difficult to measure the, the response function um, in that case. Okay, thank you. Okay, so. Um... Um, I think it's uh, 12.36. Um, I think it's time to conclude uh, this session. Um, I wish to thank uh, Daniel for his talk, but also all the speakers and the participants in this morning session. And we reconvene, I think, for the posters. Uh, for those of you who want to attend, it will be, I think, at 5 p.m., Maybe Juan, you want to say something, add something on this? Yes, uh, we will meet at uh, 5 p.m. and we can have uh, time to discuss with the, with the participants of uh, who sent posters and pre-recorded talks, but we can further discuss the, the interesting talks that we have uh, had today. So okay. we, we, we can arrange in a small groups using breakout rooms, so, so discussions will be much easier. Uh, in that format. Very interesting. So if any of you had any question to some of the talks you hear today, yesterday, uh, I understand that this uh, evening will be the good time to discuss any left question uh, to Daniel, to Ignacio, to whoever. Uh, is that correct? Um, yes. Uh, yes. Okay. So, okay. Very good. So um, we see then, uh, I encourage you to, con to participate into this uh, poster and uh, presentation poster session and presentation uh, recorded talk session because I think it can be really very interesting. It's something new, but you know, we have to adapt to survive and this is the best we can do and we are doing, I think, very well. So thank you all for contributing and for being in this morning session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.